Chapter Thirteen of the Promised Land. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Promised Land by Mary Anton. Chapter Thirteen: A Child's Paradise. All this while that I was studying and exploring in the borderland between the old life and the new, leaping at conclusions and sometimes slipping, finding inspiration in common things, and interpretations in dumb things, eagerly scaling the ladder of learning. My eyes on star diademed peaks of ambition, building up friendships that should support my youth and enrich my womanhood, learning to think much of myself and much more of my world, while I was steadily gathering in my heritage, sowed in the dim past and ripened in the sun of my own day. What was my sister doing? Why, what she had always done, keeping close to my mother's side, keeping close to my mother's side on the dreary marches of a humdrum life. Sensing sweet gardens of forbidden joy, but never turning from the path of duty, I cannot believe but that her sacrifices tasted as dust and ashes to her at times. For Frida was a mere girl whose childhood, on the whole, had been gray, while her appetite for happy things was as great as any normal girl's. She had a fine sense for what was best in the life about her, though she could not articulate her appreciation. She longed to possess the good things. But her position in the family forbidding possession, she developed a talent for vicarious enjoyment which I never in this life hoped to imitate, and her simple mind did not busy itself with self-analysis. She did not even know why she was happy. She thought life was good to her. Still, there must have been moments when she perceived that the finer things were not in themselves unattainable, but were kept from her by a social tyranny. This I can only surmise, as in our daily intercourse she never gave a sign of discontent. We continued to have a part of our life in common for some time after she went to work. We formed ourselves into an evening school, she and I and the two youngsters, for the study of English and arithmetic. As soon as the supper dishes were put away, we gathered around the kitchen table with books borrowed from school and pencils supplied by my father with eager willingness. I was the teacher, the others the diligent pupils, and the earnestness with which we labored was worthy of the great things we meant to achieve. Whether the results were commensurate with their efforts, I cannot say. I only know that Frieda's cheeks flamed with the excitement of reading English monosyllables, and her eyes shone like stars on a moonless night when I explained to her how she and I and George Washington were fellow citizens together. Inspired by our studious evenings, what Frieda Anton would not be glad to sit all day bent over the needle, that the family should keep on its feet and Mary continue at school. The morning ride on the ferry boat, when spring winds dimpled the river, may have stirred her heart with nameless longings. But when she took her place at the machine, her lot was glorified to her, and she wanted to sing. For the girls, the foreman, the boss, all talked about Mary Anton, whose poems were printed in an American newspaper. Wherever she went on her humble business, she was sure to hear her sister's name, for with characteristic loyalty, the whole Jewish community claimed kinship with me simply because I was a Jew, and they made much of my small triumphs and pointed to me with pride, just as they do when a Jew distinguishes himself in any worthy way. Frida, going home from work at sunset, when rosy buds beaded the shining stems, may have felt the weariness of those who toil for bread. But when we opened our books after supper, her spirit revived afresh, and it was only when the lamp began to smoke that she thought of taking rest. At bedtime, she and I chatted as we used to do when we were little girls in Polotsk. Only now, instead of closing our eyes to see imaginary wonders, according to a bedtime game of ours, we exchanged anecdotes about the marvelous adventures of our American life. My contributions on these occasions were boastful accounts. I have no doubt of what I did at school, and in the company of school committeemen, editors, and other notables. And Frieda's delight in my achievements was the very flower of her fine sympathy. As formerly, when I had been naughty and I invited her to share in my repentance, she used to join me in spiritual humility and solemnly dedicate herself to a better life. So now, when I was full of pride and ambition. She too felt the crown on her brows and heard the applause of future generations murmuring in her ear, and so partaking of her sister's glory, what Frida Anton would not say that her portion was sufficient reward for a youth of toil. I did not, like my sister, earn my bread in those days, but let us say that I earned my salt by sweeping, scrubbing, and scouring on Saturdays when there was no school. 
My mother's housekeeping was necessarily irregular, as she was pretty constantly occupied in the store. So there was enough for us children to do to keep the bare room shining. Even here Frida did the lion's share. It used to take me all Saturday to accomplish what Frida would do with half a dozen turns of her capable hands. I did not like housework, but I loved order, so I polished windows with a will, and even got some fun out of scrubbing, by laying out the floor in patterns, and tracing them all around the room in a lively flurry of soap suds. There is a joy that comes from doing common things well, especially if they seem hard to us. When I faced a day's housework, I was half paralyzed with a sense of inability, and I wasted precious minutes walking around it, to see what a very hard task I had. But having pitched in and conquered, it gave me an exquisite pleasure to survey my work. My hair tousled, and my dress tucked up, streaked arms bare to the elbow, I would step on my heels over the damp, clean boards, and pass my hands over the chair rounds and table legs, to prove that no dust was left. I could not wait to put my dress in order, before running out into the street to see how my window shone. Every workman who carries a dinner pail has these moments of keen delight in the product of his drudgery. Men of genius, likewise, in their hours of relaxation from their loftier tasks, prove this universal rule. I know a man who fills a chair at a great university. I have seen him hold a room of otherwise restless youths spellbound for an hour, while he discoursed about the respective inhabitants of the earth and sea at a time when nothing walked on fewer than four legs and I have seen this scholar, his ponderous tomes shelved for a space, turning over and over with cherishing hands a letter-box that he had made out of cardboard and paste, and exhibiting it proudly to his friends. For the hand was the first instrument of labor, that distinctive accomplishment by which man finally raised himself above his cousins, the lower animals, and a respect for the work of the hand survives as an instinct in all of us. The stretch of weeks from June to September, when the schools were closed, would have been hard to fill in, had it not been for the public library. At first I made myself a calendar of the vacation months, and every morning I tore off a day, and comforted myself with the decreasing number of vacation days. But after I discovered the public library, I was not impatient for the reopening of school. The library did not open till one o'clock in the afternoon, and each reader was allowed to take out only one book at a time. Long before one o'clock I was to be seen on the library steps, waiting for the door of paradise to open. I spent hours in the reading-room, pleased with the atmosphere of books, with the order and quiet of the place, so unlike anything on Arlington Street. The sense of these things permeated my consciousness, even when I was absorbed in a book, just as the rustle of pages turned and the tiptoe tread of the librarian reached my ear, without distracting my attention." Anything so wonderful as a library had never been in my life. It was even better than school in some ways. One could read and read, and learn and learn, as fast as one knew how, without being obliged to stop for stupid little girls, and in a ten of little boys to catch up with the lesson. When I went home from the library, I had a book under my arm, and I would finish it before the library opened next day, no matter till what hours of the night I burned my little lamp. What books did I read so diligently? pretty nearly everything that came to my hand. I dare say the librarian helped me select my books. But curiously enough, I do not remember. Something must have directed me, for I read a great many of the books that are written for children. Of these I remember, with the greatest delight, Louisa Elcott's stories. A less attractive series of books was of the Sunday school type. In volume after volume, a very naughty little girl by the name of Lulu was always going into tempers, that her father might have opportunity to lecture her, and point to her angelic little sister, Gracie, as an example of what she should be, after which they all felt better and prayed. Next to Louisa Elcott's books, in my esteem, were boys' books of adventure, many of them by Horatio Elger, and I read all, I suppose, of the Rollo books, by Jacob Abbott. But that was not all. I read every kind of printed rubbish that came into the house, by design or accident. A weekly story paper of a worse than worthless character, that circulated widely in our neighborhood because subscribers were rewarded with the premium of a diamond ring, warranted I don't know how many carats, occupied me for hours. The stories in this paper resembled, in breathlessness of plot, abundance of horrors, and improbability of characters, the things I used to read in Vitebsk. The text was illustrated by frequent pictures, in which the villain generally had his hands on the heroine's throat, while the hero was bursting in through a graceful drapery to the rescue of his beloved. 
If a bundle came into the house, wrapped in a stained old newspaper, I laboriously smoothed out the paper and read it through. I enjoyed it all, and found fault with nothing that I read. And, as in the case of the Viteps greetings, I cannot find that I suffered any harm. Of course, reading so many better books, there came a time when the diamond ring story paper disgusted me. But in the beginning my appetite for print was so enormous that I could let nothing pass through my hands unread, while my taste was so crude that nothing printed could offend me. Good reading matter came into the house from one other source besides the library. The Yiddish newspapers of the day were excellent, and my father subscribed to the best of them. Since that time, Yiddish journalism has sadly degenerated, through imitation of the vicious yellow journals of the American press. There was one book in the library over which I pored very often, and that was the encyclopedia. I turned usually to the names of famous people, beginning, of course, with George Washington. Oftenest of all, I read the biographical sketches of my favorite authors, and felt that the worthies must have been glad to die just to have their names and histories printed out in the Book of Fame. It seemed to me the apotheosis of glory to be even briefly mentioned in an encyclopedia, and there grew in me an enormous ambition that devoured all my other ambitions, which was no less than this, that I should live to know that after my death my name would surely be printed in the encyclopedia. It was such a prodigious thing to expect that I kept the idea a secret even from myself, just letting it lie where it sprouted, in an unexplored corner of my busy brain. But it grew on me in spite of myself, till finally I could not resist the temptation to study out the exact place in the encyclopedia where my name would belong. I saw that it would come not far from Elcott, Louisa M., and I covered my face with my hands to hide the silly, baseless joy in it. I practiced saying my name in the encyclopedic form, Anton, Mary, and I realized that it sounded chopped off, and wondered if I might not annex a middle initial. I wanted to ask my teacher about it, but I was afraid I might betray my reasons. For, infatuated though I was with the idea of greatness I might live to attain, I knew very well that thus far my claims to posthumous fame were ridiculously unfounded, and I did not want to be laughed at for my vanity. Spirit of all childhood, forgive me, forgive me, for so lightly betraying a child's dream secrets, I that smile so scoffingly to-day at the unsophisticated child that was myself. Have I found any nobler thing in life than my own longing to be noble? Would I not rather be consumed by ambitions that can never be realized than live in stupid acceptance of my neighbor's opinion of me? The statue in the public square is less a portrait of a mortal individual than a symbol of the immortal aspiration of humanity. So do not laugh at the little boy playing at soldiers if he tells you how he is going to hew the world into good behavior when he gets to be a man. And do, by all means, write my name in the Book of Fame, saying, She was one who aspired, for in that condensed form is the story of the lives of the great. Summer days are long, and the evenings we know are as long as the lampwick. So with all my reading I had time to play, and with all my studiousness I had the will to play. My favorite playmates were boys. It was but mild fun to play theater in Bessie Finkelstein's backyard, even if I had leading parts, which I made impressive by recitations in Russian, no word of which was intelligible to my audience. It was far better sport to play hide-and-seek with the boys, for I enjoyed the use of my limbs, what there was of them, I was so often reproached and teased for being little that it gave me great satisfaction to be a five-foot boy to the goal. Once a great hulky colored boy, who was the torment of the neighborhood, treated me roughly while I was playing on the street. My father, determined to teach the rascal a lesson for once, had him arrested and brought to court. The boy was locked up overnight, and he emerged from his brief imprisonment with a respect for the rights and persons of his neighbors but the moral of this incident lies not herein. What interested me more than my revenge on a bully was what I saw of the way in which justice was actually administered in the United States. Here we were gathered in the little courtroom, bearded Arlington Street against wool-headed Arlington Street, accused and accuser, witnesses, sympathizers, sightseers, and all. Nobody cringed, nobody was bullied, nobody lied who didn't want to. We were all free, and all treated equally, just as it said in the Constitution. The evildoer was actually punished, and not the victim, as might very easily happen in a similar case in Russia. Liberty and justice for all. Three cheers for the red, white, and blue. 
There was one occasion in the week when I was ever willing to put away my book, no matter how entrancing were its pages. That was on Saturday night, when Bessie Finkelstein called for me, and Bessie and I, with arms entwined, called for Sadie Rabinovich, and Bessie and Sadie and I, still further entwined, called for Annie Riley, and Bessie, etc., etc., inextricably wound up, marched up Broadway, and took possession of all we saw, heard, guessed, or desired, from end to end of that main thoroughfare of Chelsea. Parading all abreast, as many as we were, only breaking ranks to let people pass, leaving the imprints of our noses and fingers on plate-glass windows ablaze with electric lights and alluring with display, inspecting tons of cheap candy to find a few pennies worth of the most enduring kind, the same to be sucked and chewed by the company, turn and turn about, as we continued our promenade, loitering wherever a crowd gathered, or running for a block or so to cheer on the fire-engine or police ambulance, getting into everybody's way, and just keeping clear of serious mischief. We were only girls. We enjoyed ourselves as only children can whose fathers keep a basement grocery store, whose mothers do their own washing, and whose sisters operate a machine for five dollars a week. Had we been boys, I suppose Bessie and Sadie and the rest of us would have been a gang, and would have popped into the Chinese laundry to tease Chinky Chinaman, and been chased by the cops from comfortable doorsteps, and had a bully time of it. Being what we were, we called ourselves a set, and we had a lovely time, as people who passed us on Broadway could not fail to see, and hear. For we were at the giggling age, and Broadway on Saturday night was full of giggles for us. We stayed out till all hours, too, for Arlington Street had no strict domestic program, not even in the nursery, the inmates of which were as likely to be found in the gutter as in their cots, at any time this side of one o'clock in the morning. There was an element in my enjoyment that was yielded neither by the sights, the adventures, nor the chewing candy. I had a keen feeling for the sociability of the crowd. All plebeian Chelsea was abroad, and a bourgeois population is nowhere unneighborly. Women shapeless with bundles, their hats awry over thin, eager faces, gathered in knots on the edge of the curb, boasting of their bargains. Little girls in curl papers and little boys in brimless hats clung to their skirts, whining for pennies, only to be silenced by absent-minded cuffs. A few disconsolate fathers strayed behind these family groups, the rest being distributed between the barber shops and the corner lamp posts. I understood these people, being one of them, and I liked them, and I found it all delightfully sociable. Saturday night is the workman's wife's night. But that does not entirely prevent my lady from going abroad, if only to leave an order at the florist's. So it happened that Bellingham Hill and Washington Avenue, the aristocratic sections of Chelsea, mingled with Arlington Street on Broadway, to the further enhancement of my enjoyment of the occasion. For I always loved a mixed crowd. I loved the contrasts, the high lights and deep shadows, and the gradations that connect the two and make all life one. I saw many, many things that I was not aware of seeing at the time. I only found out afterwards what treasures my brain had stored up. When coming to the puzzling places in life, light and meaning would suddenly burst on me, the hidden fruit of some experience that had not impressed me at the time. How many times, I wonder, did I brush past my destiny on Broadway, foolishly staring after it, instead of going home to pray? I wonder, did a stranger collide with me, and put me patiently out of his way, wondering why such a mite was not at home and abed at ten o'clock in the evening, and never dreaming that one day he might have to reckon with me? Did someone smile down on my childish glee, I wonder, unwarned of a day when we should weep together? I wonder, I wonder, a million threads of life and love and sorrow was the common street, and whether we would or not, we entangled ourselves in a common maze without paying the homage of a second glance to those who would some day master us. Too dull to pick that face from out the crowd which one day would bend over us in love or pity or remorse. What company of skipping, laughing little girls is to be reproached for careless hours, when men and women on every side stepped heedlessly into the traps of fate? Small sin it was to annoy my neighbor by getting in his way, as I stared over my shoulder. If a grown man knew no better than to drop a word in passing that might turn the course of another's life, as a boulder rolled down from the mountainside deflects the current of a brook. End of chapter 13、Chapter、14 of The Promised Land This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Promised Land by Mary Anton. Chapter 14 
Manna. So went the life in Chelsea for the space of a year or so. Then my father, finding a discrepancy between his assets and liabilities on the wrong side of the ledger, once more struck tent, collected his flock, and set out in search of richer pastures. There was a charming simplicity about these proceedings. Here today, apparently rooted, there tomorrow, and just as much at home. Another basement grocery, with a freshly painted sign over the door, the broom in the corner, the loaf on the table. These things made home for us. There were rather more Negroes on Wheeler Street, in the lower south end of Boston, than there had been on Arlington Street, which promised more numerous outstanding accounts. But they were a neighborly folk, and they took us strangers in, sometimes very badly. Then there was the school three blocks away, where America was sung to the same tune as in Chelsea, and geography was made as dark a mystery. It was impossible not to feel at home. And presently, lest anything be lacking to our domestic bliss, there was a new baby in a borrowed crib, and little Dora had only a few more turns to take with her battered doll carriage, before a life-size vehicle, with a more animated dolly, was turned over to her constant care. The Wheeler Street neighborhood is not a place where a refined young lady would care to find herself alone, even in the cheery daylight. If she came at all, she would be attended by a trusty escort. She would not get too close to people on the doorsteps, and she would shrink away in disgust and fear from a blear-eyed creature careering down the sidewalk on many jointed legs. The delicate damsel would hasten home to wash and purify and perfume herself till the foul contact of Wheeler Street was utterly eradicated, and her wanted purity restored. And I do not blame her. I only wish that she would bring a little soap and water and perfumery into Wheeler Street next time she comes. For some people there may be smothering in the filth, which they abhor as much as she, but from which they cannot, like her, run away. Many years after my escape from Wheeler Street, I returned to see if the place was as bad as I remembered it. I found the narrow street grown even narrower, the sidewalk not broad enough for two to walk abreast. The gutter choked with dust and refuse, the dingy row of tenements on either side unspeakably gloomy. I discovered what I had not realized before, that Wheeler Street was a crooked lane connecting a corner saloon on Shama Avenue with a block of houses of ill repute on Corning Street. It had been the same in my day, but I had not understood much, and I lived unharmed. On this later visit, I walked slowly up one side of the street and down the other, remembering many things. It was eleven o'clock in the evening, and sounds of squabbling coming through doors and windows informed my experienced ear that a part of Wheeler Street was going to bed. The grocery store in the basement of number eleven, my father's old store, was still open for business and in the gutter in front of the store, to be sure, was a happy baby, just as there used to be. I was not alone on this tour of inspection. I was attended by a trusty escort. But I brought soap and water with me. I am applying them now. I found no fault with Wheeler Street when I was fourteen years old. On the contrary, I pronounced it good. We had never lived so near the car tracks before, and I delighted in the moonlike splendor of the arc lamp just in front of the saloon. The space illumined by this lamp, and enlivened by the passage of many thirsty souls, was the favorite playground for Wheeler Street youth. On our street there was not room to turn around. Here the sidewalk spread out wider as it swung around to Shawmaw Avenue. I played with the boys by preference, as in Chelsea. I learned to cut across the tracks in front of an oncoming car, and it was great fun to see the motorman's angry face turn scared when he thought I was going to be shaved this time sure. It was amusing, too, to watch the side door of the saloon, which opened right opposite the grocery store, and see a drunken man put out by the bartender. The fellow would whine so comically, and cling to the doorpost, so like a damp leaf to a twig, and blubber so like a red-faced baby, that it was really funny to see him. And there was Morgan Chapel. It was worth coming to Wheeler Street just for that. All the children of the neighborhood, except the most rowdyish, flocked to Morgan Chapel at least once a week. This was on Saturday evening, when a free entertainment was given, consisting of music, recitations, and other parlor accomplishments. The performances were exceedingly artistic, according to the impartial judgment of juvenile Wheeler Street. I can speak with authority for the crowd of us from number eleven. We hung upon the lips of the beautiful ladies who read or sang to us, and they in turn did their best, recognizing the quality of our approval. 
We admired the miraculously clean gentlemen who sang or played, as heartily as we applauded their performance. Sometimes the beautiful ladies were accompanied by ravishing little girls, who stood up in a glory of golden curls, frilled petticoats, and silk stockings, to recite pathetic or comic pieces, with trained expression and practiced gestures, that seemed to us the perfection of the elocutionary art. We were all a little bit stage-struck after these entertainments, but what was more, we were genuinely moved by the glimpses of a fairer world than ours, which we caught through the music and poetry, the world in which the beautiful ladies dwelt with the fairy children and the clean gentlemen. Brother Hotchkins, who managed these entertainments, knew what he was there for. His programs were masterly. Classics of the lighter sort were judiciously interspersed with the favorite street songs of the day. Nothing that savored of the chapel was there. The hour was honestly devoted to entertainment. The total effect was an exquisitely balanced compound of pleasure, wonder, and longing. Knock-kneed men with purple noses, bristling chins, and no collars, who slouched in skeptically, and sat tentatively on the edge of the rear settees at the beginning of the concert, moved nearer the front as the program went on, and openly joined in the applause at the end. Scowling fellows, who came in with defiant faces, occasionally slunk out shamefaced. And both the knock kneed and the defiant sometimes remained to hear Brother Tompkins pray and preach. And it was all due to Brother Hotchkins' masterly program. The children behaved very well for the most part. The few toughs who came in on purpose to make trouble were promptly expelled by Brother Hotchkins and his lieutenants. I could not help admiring Brother Hotchkins. He was so eminently efficient in every part of the hall, at every stage of the proceedings. I always believed that he was the author of the alluring notices that occupied the bulletin board every Saturday, though I never knew it for a fact. The way he handled the bad boys was masterly. The way he introduced the performers was inimitable. The way he did everything was the best way. And yet I did not like Brother Hotchkins. I could not. He was too slim, too pale, too fair. His voice was too encouraging. His smile was too restrained. The man was a missionary, and it stuck out all over him. I could not abide a missionary. That was the Jew in me, the European Jew, trained by the cruel centuries of his outcast existence, to distrust any one who spoke of God by any other name than Adonai. But I should have resented the suggestion that inherited distrust was the cause of my dislike for good brother Hotchkins for I considered myself freed from racial prejudices, by the same triumph of my infallible judgment which had lifted me from the yoke of credulity. An uncompromising atheist, such as I was at the age of fourteen, was bound to scorn all those who sought to implant religion in their fellow men, and thereby prolong the reign of superstition. Of course that was the explanation. Brother Hotchkins, happily unconscious of my disapproval of his complexion, arose at intervals behind the railing, to announce from a slip of paper that the next number on our program will be a musical selection by, etc., etc., until he arrived at, I am sure you will all join me in thanking the ladies and gentlemen who have entertained us this evening. And as I moved towards the door with my companions, I would hear his voice raised for the inevitable. You are all invited to remain to a short prayer service, after which, a little louder, refreshments will be served in the vestry. I will ask Brother Tompkins to— The rest was lost in the shuffle of feet about the door, and the roar of electric cars glancing past each other on opposite tracks. I always got out of the chapel before Brother Tompkins could do me any harm, as if there was anything he could steal from me, now that there was no God in my heart. If I were to go back to Morgan Chapel now, I should stay to hear Brother Tompkins, and as many other brethren as might have anything to say. I would sit very still in my corner seat, and listen to the prayer, and silently join in the Amen. For I know now what Wheeler Street is, and I know what Morgan Chapel is there for, in the midst of those crooked alleys, those saloons, those pawn-shops, those gloomy tenements. It is there to apply soap and water, and it is doing that all the time. I have learned since my deliverance from Wheeler Street that there is more than one road to any given goal. I should look with respect at Brother Hotchkins applying soap and water in his own way, convinced at last that my way is not the only way. Men must work with those tools to the use of which they are best fitted by nature. Brother Hotchkins must pray, and I must bear witness, and another must nurse a feeble infant. We are all honest workmen, and all deserve standing room in the workshop of sweating humanity. 
It is only the idle scoffers who stand by and jeer at our efforts to cleanse our house that should be kicked out of the door as Brother Hotchkiss turned out the rowdies. It was characteristic of the looseness of our family discipline at this time that nobody was seriously interested in our visits to Morgan Chapel. Our time was our own, after school duties and household tasks were done. Joseph sold newspapers after school. I swept and washed dishes. Dora minded the baby. For the rest, we amused ourselves as best we could. Father and mother were preoccupied with the store day and night, and not so much with weighing and measuring and making change, as with figuring out how long it would take the outstanding accounts to ruin the business entirely. If my mother had scruples against her children resorting to a building with a cross on it, she did not have time to formulate them. If my father heard us talking about Morgan Chapel, he dismissed the subject with a sarcastic characterization, and wanted to know if we were going to join the Salvation Army next. But he did not seriously care, and he was willing that the children should have a good time. And if my parents had objected to Morgan Chapel, was the sidewalk in front of the saloon a better place for us children to spend the evening? They could not have argued with us very long, so they hardly argued at all. In Polotsk we had been trained and watched, our days had been regulated, our conduct prescribed. In America, suddenly, we were let loose on the street. Why? Because my father having renounced his faith, and my mother being uncertain of hers, they had no particular creed to hold us to. The conception of a system of ethics independent of religion could not at once enter as an active principle in their life, so that they could give a child no reason why to be truthful or kind. And as with religion, so it fared with other branches of our domestic education. Chaos took the place of system, uncertainty, inconsistency undermined discipline, my parents knew only that they desired us to be like American children, and seeing how their neighbors gave their children boundless liberty, they turned us also loose, never doubting but that the American way was the best way. In public deportment, in etiquette, in all matters of social intercourse, they had no standards to go by, seeing that America was not Polotsk. In their bewilderment and uncertainty, they must needs trust us children to learn from such models as the tenements afforded. More than this, they must step down from their throne of parental authority, and take the law from their children's mouths, for they had no other means of finding out what was good American form. The result was that laxity of domestic organization, that inversion of normal relations which makes for friction, and which sometimes ends in breaking a family that was formerly united and happy. This sad process of disintegration of home life may be observed in almost any immigrant family of our class and with our traditions and aspirations. It is part of the process of Americanization, an upheaval preceding the state of repose. It is the cross that the first and second generations must bear, an involuntary sacrifice for the sake of the future generations. These are the pains of adjustment, as racking as the pains of birth, and as the mother forgets her agonies in the bliss of clasping her babe to her breast, so the bent and heart-sore immigrant forgets exile and homesickness and ridicule and loss and estrangement, when he beholds his sons and daughters moving as Americans among Americans. On Wheeler Street there were no real homes. There were miserable flats of three or four rooms, or fewer, in which families that did not practice race suicide cooked, washed, and ate, slept from two to four in a bed, in windowless bedrooms, quarreled in the gray morning, and made up in the smoky evening, tormented each other, supported each other, saved each other, drove each other out of the house. But there was no common life in any form that means life. There was no room for it, for one thing. Beds and cribs took up most of the floor space. Disorder packed the inner spaces. The center table in the parlor was not loaded with books. It held, invariably, a photograph album and an ornamental lamp with a paper shade, and the lamp was usually out of order. So there was as little motive for a common life as there was room. The yard was only big enough for the perennial rubbish heap. The narrow sidewalk was crowded. What were the people to do with themselves? There were the saloons, the missions, the libraries, the cheap amusement places, and the neighborhood houses. People selected their resorts according to their tastes. The children, let it be thankfully recorded, flocked mostly to the clubs. The little girls to sew, cook, dance, and play games. The little boys to hammer and paste, mend chairs, debate, and govern a toy republic. All these, of course, are forms of baptism by soap and water. 
Our neighborhood went in search of salvation to Morgan Memorial Hall, Barnard Memorial, Morgan Chapel, aforementioned, and some other clean places that lighted a candle in their window. My brother, my sister Dora, and I were introduced to some of the clubs by our young neighbors, and we were glad to go, for our home also gave us little besides meals in the kitchen and beds in the dark. What with the six of us and the store, and the baby, and sometimes a greener or two from Polotsk, whom we lodged as a matter of course, till they found a permanent home. What with such company and the size of our tenement, we needed to get out almost as much as our neighbor's children. I say almost, for our parlor we managed to keep pretty clear, and the lamp on our center table was always in order, and its light fell often on an open book. Still, it was part of the life of Wheeler Street to belong to clubs, so we belonged. I didn't care for sewing or cooking, so I joined a dancing club, and even here I was a failure. I had been a very good dancer in Russia, but here I found all the steps different, and I did not have the courage to go out in the middle of the slippery floor and mince it and tow it in front of the teacher. When I retired to a corner and tried to play dominoes, I became suddenly shy of my partner, and I never could win a game of checkers, although formerly I used to beat my father at it. I tried to be friends with a little girl I had known in Chelsea, but she met my advances coldly. She lived on Appleton Street, which was too aristocratic to mix with Wheeler Street. Geraldine was studying elocution, and she wore a scarlet cape and hood, and she was going on the stage by and by. I acknowledged that her sense of superiority was well founded, and retired farther into my corner, for the first time conscious of my shabbiness and lowliness. I looked on at the dancing until I could endure it no longer. Overcome by a sense of isolation and unfitness, I slipped out of the room, avoiding the teacher's eye, and went home to write melancholy poetry. What had come over me? Why was I, the confident, the ambitious, suddenly grown so shy and meek? Why was the candidate for encyclopedic immortality overawed by a scarlet hood? Why did I, a very tomboy yesterday, suddenly find my playmate stupid and hide-and-seek a bore? I did not know why. I only knew that I was lonely and troubled and sore, and I went home to write sad poetry. I shall never forget the pattern of the red carpet in our parlor. We had achieved a carpet since Chelsea days, because I lay for hours face down on the floor, writing poetry on a screechy slate. When I had perfected my verses and copied them fair on the famous blue-lined notepaper, and saw that I had made a very pathetic poem indeed, I felt better, and this happened over and over again. I gave up the dancing club, I ceased to know the rowdy little boys, and I wrote melancholy poetry oftener, and felt better. The center table became my study. I read much, and mooned between chapters, and wrote long letters to Miss Dillingham. For some time I wrote to her almost daily. That was when I found in my heart such depths of woe as I could not pack into rhyme. And finally there came a day when I could utter my trouble in neither verse nor prose, and I implored Miss Dillingham to come to me and hear my sorrowful revelations. But I did not want her to come to the house. In the house there was no privacy. I could not talk. Would she meet me on Boston Common at such and such a time? Would she? She was a devoted friend and a wise woman. She met me on Boston Common. It was a gray autumn day. Was it not actually drizzling? And I was cold sitting on the bench. But I was thrilled through and through with the sense of the magnitude of my troubles, and of the romantic nature of the rendezvous. Who that was even half awake when he was growing up does not know what all these symptoms betoken. Miss Dillingham understood, and she wisely gave me no inkling of her diagnosis. She let me talk, and kept a grave face. She did not belittle my troubles. I made specific charges against my home, members of my family, and life in general. She did not say that I would get over them, that every growing girl suffers from the blues, that I was, in brief, a little goose stretching my wings for flight. She told me, rather, that it would be noble to bear my sorrows bravely, to soothe those who irritated me, to live each day with all my might. She reminded me of great men and women who have suffered, and who overcame their troubles by living and working. And she sent me home amazingly comforted, my pettiness and self-consciousness routed by the quiet influence of her gray eyes searching mine. This, or something like this, had to be repeated many times, as anybody will know who was present at the slow birth of his manhood. From now on, for some years, of course, I must weep and laugh out of season, stand on tiptoe to pluck the stars in heaven, 
love and hate immoderately, propound theories on the destiny of man, and not know what is going on in my own heart. End of chapter 14「Chapter fifteen of the Promised Land. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Promised Land by Mary Anton. Chapter fifteen. Tarnished Laurels. In the intervals of hearkening to my growing pains, I was, of course, still a little girl. As a little girl, in many ways immature for my age, I finished my course in the grammar school, and was graduated with honors, four years after my landing in Boston. Wheeler Street recognizes five great events in a girl's life, namely, christening, confirmation, graduation, marriage, and burial. These occasions all require full dress for the heroine, and full dress is forthcoming, no matter if the family goes into debt for it. There was not a girl who came to school in rags all the year round that did not burst forth in sudden glory on graduation day. Fine muslin frocks, lace-trimmed petticoats, patent leather shoes, perishable hats, gloves, parasols, fans. Every girl had them. A mother who had scrubbed floors for years to keep her girl in school was not going to have her shamed in the end for want of a pretty dress. So she cut off the children's supply of butter and worked nights, and borrowed and fell into arrears with the rent. And on graduation day she felt magnificently rewarded, seeing her Mamie as fine as any girl in the school. And in order to preserve for posterity this triumphant spectacle, she took Mamie, after the exercises, to be photographed, with her diploma in one hand, a bouquet in the other, and the gloves, fan, parasol, and patent leather shoes in full sight around a fancy table. Truly, the follies of the poor are worth studying. It did not strike me as folly, but as the fulfillment of the portent of my natal star, when I saw myself, on graduation day, arrayed like unto a princess. Frills, lace, patent leather shoes, I had everything. I even had a sash with silk fringes. Did I speak of folly? Listen, and I will tell you quite another tale. Perhaps when you have heard it, you will not be too hasty to run and teach the poor. Perhaps you will admit that the poor may have something to teach you. Before we had been two years in America, my sister Frida was engaged to be married. This was under the old dispensation. Frida came to America too late to avail herself of the gifts of an American girlhood. Had she been two years younger, she might have dodged her circumstances, evaded her old-world fate. She would have gone to school and imbibed American ideas. She might have clung to her girlhood longer instead of marrying at seventeen. I am so fond of the American way that it has always seemed to me a pitiful accident that my sister should have come so near and missed by so little the fulfillment of my country's promise to woman. A long girlhood, a free choice in marriage, and a brimful world are the precious rights of an American woman. My father was too recently from the old world to be entirely free from the influence of its social traditions. He had put Frida to work out of necessity. The necessity was hardly lifted when she had an offer of marriage. But my father would not stand in the way of what he considered her welfare. Let her escape from the workshop, if she had a chance, while the roses were still in her cheeks. If she remained for ten years more bent over the needle, what would she gain? Not even her personal comfort, for Frida never called her earnings her own, but spent everything on the family, denying herself all but the necessities. The young man who sued for her was a good workman, earning fair wages, of irreproachable character and refined manners. My father had known him for years. So Frida was to be released from the workshop. The act was really in the nature of a sacrifice on my father's part, for he was still in the woods financially, and would sorely miss Frida's wages. The greater the pity, therefore, that there was no one to counsel him to give America more time with my sister. She attended the night school. She was fond of reading. In books, in a slowly ripening experience, she might have found a better answer to the riddle of a girl's life than a premature marriage. My sister's engagement pleased me very well. Our confidences were not interrupted, and I understood that she was happy. I was very fond of Moses Rifkin myself. He was the nicest young man of my acquaintance, not at all like other workmen. He was very kind to us children, bringing us presents and taking us out for excursions. He had a sense of humor, and he was going to marry our Frida. How could I help being pleased? The marriage was not to take place for some time, and in the interval Frida remained in the shop. 
she continued to bring home all her wages. If she was going to desert the family, she would not let them feel it sooner than she must. Then, all of a sudden, she turned spendthrift. She appropriated I do not know what fabulous sums, to spend just as she pleased for once. She attended bargain sales, and brought away such finery as had never graced our flat before. Home from work in the evening, after a hurried supper, she shut herself up in the parlor, and cut and snipped, and measured and basted, and stitched, as if there were nothing else in the world to do. It was early summer, and the air had a wooing touch, even on Wheeler Street. Moses Rifkin came, and I suppose he also had a wooing touch. But Frida only smiled, and shook her head, and as her mouth was full of pins, it was physically impossible for Moses to argue. She remained all evening in a white disorder of tucked breaths, curled ruffles, dismembered sleeves, and swirls of fresh lace, her needle glancing in the lamplight, and poor Moses picking up her spools. Her trousseau, was it not? No, not her trousseau. It was my graduation dress on which she was so intent. And when it was finished, and was pronounced a most beautiful dress, and she ought to have been satisfied, Frida went to the shops once more, and bought the sash with the silk fringes. The improvidence of the poor is a most distressing spectacle to all right-minded students of sociology. But please spare me your homily this time. It does not apply. The poor are the poor in spirit. Those who are rich in spiritual endowment will never be found bankrupt. Graduation day was nothing less than a triumph for me. It was not only that I had two pieces to speak, one of them an original composition. It was more because I was known in my school district as the smartest girl in the class, and all eyes were turned on the prodigy, and I was aware of it. I was aware of everything. That is why I am able to tell you everything now. The assembly hall was crowded to bursting, but my friends had no trouble in finding seats. They were ushered up to the platform, which was reserved for guests of honor. I was very proud to see my friends treated with such distinction. My parents were there, and Frida, of course, Miss Dillingham, and some others of my Chelsea teachers. A dozen or so of my humbler friends and acquaintances were scattered among the crowd on the floor. When I stepped up on the stage to read my composition, I was seized with stage fright. The floor under my feet and the air around me were oppressively present to my senses, while my own hand I could not have located. I did not know where my body began or ended. I was so conscious of my gloves, my shoes, my flowing sash. My wonderful dress, in which I had taken so much satisfaction, gave me the most trouble. I was suddenly paralyzed by a conviction that it was too short, and it seemed to me I stood on absurdly long legs. And ten thousand people were looking up at me. It was horrible. I suppose I no more than cleared my throat before I began to read. But to me it seemed that I stood petrified for an age, an awful silence booming in my ears. My voice, when at last I began, sounded far away. I thought that nobody could hear me, but I kept on mechanically, for I had rehearsed many times. And as I read I gradually forgot myself, forgot the place and the occasion. The people looking up at me heard the story of a beautiful little boy, my cousin, whom I had loved very dearly, and who died in far distant Russia some years after I came to America. My composition was not a masterpiece. It was merely good for a girl of fifteen. But I had written that I still loved the little cousin, and I made a thousand strangers feel it. And before the applause there was a moment of stillness in the great hall. After the singing and reading by the class, there were the customary addresses by distinguished guests. We girls were reminded that we were going to be women, and happiness was promised to those of us who had aimed to be noble women. A great money trite and obvious things. A great deal of the rhetoric appropriate to the occasion. Compliments, applause, general satisfaction. So went the program. Much of the rhetoric, many of the fine sentiments, did not penetrate to the thoughts of us for whom they were intended because we were in such a flutter about our ruffles and ribbons, and could hardly refrain from openly prinking. But we applauded very heartily every speaker, and every would-be speaker, understanding that by a consensus of opinion on the platform we were very fine young ladies, and much was to be expected of us. One of the last speakers was introduced as a member of the school board. He began like all the rest of them, but he ended differently— Abandoning generalities, he went on to tell the story of a particular schoolgirl, a pupil in a Boston school, whose phenomenal career might serve as an illustration of what the American system of free education and the European immigrant could make of each other. He had not got very far, when I realized, to my great surprise and no small delight, 
that he was telling my story. I saw my friends on the platform beaming behind the speaker, and I heard my name whispered in the audience. I had been so much of a celebrity, in a small local way, that identification of the speaker's heroine was inevitable. My classmates, of course, guessed the name, and they turned to look at me, and nudged me, and all but pointed at me, their new muslins rustling, and silk ribbons hissing. One or two of the nearest me forgot etiquette so far as to whisper to me, Mary Anton, they said, as the speaker sat down, amid a burst of the most enthusiastic applause. Mary Anton, why don't you get up and thank him? I was dazed with all that had happened. Bursting with pride I was, but I was moved, too, by nobler feelings. I realized in a vague, far-off way what it meant to my father and mother to be sitting there and seeing me held up as a paragon. My history made the theme of an eloquent discourse what it meant to my father to see his ambitious hopes thus gloriously fulfilled, his judgment of me verified, what it meant to Frida to hear me all but named with such honor. With all these things choking my heart to overflowing, my wits forsook me, if I had had any at all that day. The audience was stirring and whispering so that I could hear. Who is it? Is that so? And again they prompted me, Mary Anton, get up, get up and thank him, Mary. And I rose where I sat, and in a voice that sounded thin as a fly's after the oratorical bass of the last speaker, I began, I want to thank you. That is as far as I got. Mr. Swan, the principal, waved his hand to silence me. And then, and only then, did I realize the enormity of what I had done. My eulogist had had the good taste not to mention names, and I had been brazenly forward, deliberately calling attention to myself when there was no need. Oh, it was sickening. I hated myself. I hated with all my heart the girls who had prompted me to such immodest conduct. I wished the ground would yawn and snap me up. I was ashamed to look up at my friends on the platform. What was Miss Dillingham thinking of me? Oh, what a fool I had been. I had ruined my own triumph. I had disgraced myself, and my friends, and poor Mr. Swan, and the Winthrop School. The monster vanity had sucked out my wits, and left me a staring idiot." It is easy to say that I was making a mountain out of a molehill, a catastrophe out of a mere breach of good manners. It is easy to say that. But I know that I suffered agonies of shame. After the exercises, when the crowd pressed in all directions in search of friends, I tried in vain to get out of the hall. I was mobbed, I was lionized. Everybody wanted to shake hands with the prodigy of the day, and they knew who it was. I had made sure of that. I had exhibited myself. The people smiled on me, flattered me, passed me on from one to another. I smirked back, but I did not know what I said. I was wild to be clear of the building. I thought everybody mocked me. All my roses had turned to ashes, and all through my own brazen conduct. I would have given my diploma to have Miss Dillingham know how the thing had happened, but I could not bring myself to speak first. If she would ask me, but nobody asked, nobody looked away from me, everybody congratulated me, my father and mother, and my remotest relations. But the sting of shame smarted just the same. I could not be consoled. I had made a fool of myself. Mr. Swan had publicly put me down. Ah, so that was it. Vanity was the vital spot again. It was wounded vanity that writhed and squirmed. It was not because I had been bold, but because I had been pronounced bold, that I suffered so monstrously. If Mr. Swan, with an eloquent gesture, had not silenced me, I might have made my little speech. Good heavens, what did I mean to say? And probably called it another feather in my bonnet. But he had stopped me promptly, disgusted with my forwardness, and he had shown before all those hundreds what he thought of me. Therein lay the sting. With all my talent for self-analysis, it took me a long time to realize the essential pettiness of my trouble. For years, actually for years, after that eventful day of mingled triumph and disgrace, I could not think of the unhappy incident without inward squirming. I remember distinctly how the little scene would suddenly flash upon me at night, as I lay awake in bed, and I would turn over impatiently, as if to shake off a nightmare, and this so long after the occurrence, that I myself was amazed at the persistence of the nightmare. I had never been reproached by any one for my conduct on graduation day. Why could I not forgive myself? I studied the matter deeply. It wearies me to remember how deeply— till at last I understood that it was wounded vanity that hurt so, and no nobler remorse. Then, and only then, was the ghost laid. If it ever tried to get up again after that, I only had to call it names to see it scurry back to its grave and pull the sod down after it. 
Before I had laid my ghost, a friend told me of a similar experience of his boyhood. He was present at a small private entertainment, and a violinist, who should have played being absent, the host asked for a volunteer to take his place. My friend, then a boy in his teens, offered himself, and actually stood up with the violin in his hands, as if to play. But he could not even hold the instrument properly. He had never been taught the violin. He told me he never knew what possessed him to get up and make a fool of himself before a room full of people. But he was certain that ten thousand imps possessed him and tormented him for years and years after, if only he remembered the incident. My friend's confession was such a consolation to me that I could not help thinking I might do some other poor wretch a world of good by offering him my company and that of my friend in his misery. For if it took me a long time to find out that I was a vain fool, the corollary did not escape me. There must be other vain fools. End of chapter 15. Chapter 16 of the Promised Land. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Promised Land by Mary Anton. Chapter 16. Dover Street. What happened next was Dover Street. And what was Dover Street? Ask rather, what was it not? Dover Street was my fairest garden of girlhood, a gate of paradise, a window facing on a broad avenue of life. Dover Street was a prison, a school of discipline, a battlefield of sordid strife. The air in Dover Street was heavy with evil odors of degradation, but a breath from the uppermost heavens rippled through, whispering of infinite things. In Dover Street the dragon poverty gripped me for a last fight, but I overthrew the hideous creature and sat on his neck as on a throne. In Dover Street I was shackled with a hundred chains of disadvantage, but with one free hand I planted little seeds, right there in the mud of shame, that blossomed into the honeyed rose of widest freedom. In Dover Street there was often no loaf on the table, but the hand of some noble friend was ever in mine. The night in Dover Street was rent with the cries of wrong, but the thunders of truth crashed through the pitiful clamor and died out in prophetic silences. Outwardly, Dover Street is a noisy thoroughfare cut through a south end slum, in every essential the same as Wheeler Street. Turn down any street in the slums, at random, and call it by whatever name you please. You will observe there the same fashions of life, death, and endurance. Every one of those streets is a rubbish heap of damaged humanity, and it will take a powerful broom and an ocean of soapsuds to clean it out. Dover Street is intersected, near its eastern end where we lived, by Harrison Avenue. That street is to the south end what Salem Street is to the north end. It is the heart of the south end ghetto, for the greater part of its length, although its northern end belongs to the realm of Chinatown. Its multifarious business bursts through the narrow shop doors, and overruns the basements, the sidewalk, the street itself, in pushcarts and open-air stands. Its multitudinous population bursts through the greasy tenement doors, and floods the corridors, the doorsteps, the gutters, the side streets, pushing in and out among the pushcarts, all day long and half the night besides. Rarely as Harrison Avenue is caught asleep, even more rarely is it found clean. Nothing less than a fire or flood would cleanse this street, even Passover cannot quite accomplish this feat, for although the tenements may be scrubbed to their remotest corners, on this one occasion the cleansing stops at the curbstone. A great deal of the filthy rubbish accumulated in a year is pitched into the street, often through the windows, and what the ashman on his daily round does not remove is left to be trampled to powder, in which form it steals back into the houses from which it was so lately removed. The city fathers provide soap and water for the slums, in the form of excellent schools, kindergartens, and branch libraries. And there they stop, at the curbstone of the people's life. They cleanse and discipline the children's minds, but their bodies they pitch into the gutter. For there are no parks and almost no playgrounds in the Harrison Avenue district. In my day there were none, and such as there are have been wrenched from the city by public-spirited citizens, who have no offices in City Hall. No wonder the Ashman is not more thorough. He learns from his masters." It is a pity to have it so, in a queen of enlightened cities like Boston. If we of the twentieth century do not believe in baseball as much as philosophy, we have not learned the lesson of modern science, which teaches, among other things, that the body is the nursery of the soul, the instrument of our moral development, 
the secret chart of our devious progress from worm to man. The great achievement of recent science, of which we are so proud, has been the deciphering of the hieroglyphic of organic nature. To worship the facts and neglect the implications of the message of science is to applaud the drama without taking the moral to heart. And we certainly are not taking the moral to heart when we try to make a hero out of the boy by such foreign appliances as grammar and algebra, while utterly despising the fittest instrument for his uplifting, the boy's own body. We had no particular reason for coming to Dover Street. It might just have well been Apple Pie Alley, for my father had sold, with the goods, fixtures, and good will of the Wheeler Street store, all his hopes of ever making a living in the grocery trade, and I doubt if he got a silver dollar the more for them. We had to live somewhere, even if we were not making a living. So we came to Dover Street, where tenements were cheap, by which I mean that rent was low. The ultimate cost of life in those tenements, in terms of human happiness, is high enough. Our new home consisted of five small rooms up two flights of stairs, with the right of way through the dark corridors. In the parlor, the dingy paper hung in rags, and the plaster fell in chunks. One of the bedrooms was absolutely dark and airtight. The kitchen windows looked out on a dirty court, at the back of which was the rear tenement of the estate. To us belonged, along with the five rooms and the right of way aforesaid, a block of upper space the length of a pulley line across this court, and the width of an arc described by a windy Monday's washing in its remotest wanderings. The little front bedroom was assigned to me, with only one partner, my sister Dora. A mouse could not have led a cat much of a chase across this room. Still, we found space for a narrow bed, a crazy bureau, and a small table. From the window there was an unobstructed view of a lumber yard, beyond which frowned the blackened walls of a factory. The fence of the lumber yard was gay with theater posters and illustrated advertisements of tobacco, whiskey, and patent baby foods. When the window was open, there was a constant clang and whir of electric cars, varied by the screech of machinery, the clatter of empty wagons, or the rumble of heavy trucks. There was nothing worse in all this than we had had before since our exile from Crescent Beach, but I did not take the same delight in the propiniquity of electric cars and arc lights that I had till now. I suppose the tenement began to pale on me. It must not be supposed that I enjoyed any degree of privacy, because I had half a room to myself. We were six in the five rooms. We were bound to be always in each other's way. And as it was within our flat, so it was in the house as a whole. All doors, beginning with the street door, stood open most of the time. Or if they were closed, the tenants did not wear out their knuckles knocking for admittance. I could stand at any time in the unswept entrance hall and tell, from an analysis of the medley of sounds and smells that issued from doors ajar, what was going on in the several flats from below up. That guttural, scolding voice, unremittent as the hissing of a steam pipe, is Mrs. Renoski. I make a guess that she is chastising the infant Isaac for taking a second lump of sugar in his tea. Spam, bam, yes, and she is rubbing in her objections with the flat of her hand. That blubbering and moaning, accompanying an elephantine tread, is fat Mrs. Casey, second floor, home drunk from an afternoon out, in fear of the vengeance of Mr. Casey, to propitiate whom she is burning a pan of bacon, as the choking fumes and outrageous sizzling testify. I hear a feeble whining, interrupted by long silences. It is that scabby baby on the third floor, fallen out of bed again, with nobody home to pick him up. To escape these various horrors, I ascend to the roof, where bacon and babies and child-beating are not. But there I find two figures in calico wrappers, with bare red arms akimbo, a basket of wet clothes in front of each, and only one empty clothesline between them. I do not want to be dragged in as a witness in case of assault and battery, so I descend to the street again, grateful to note, as I pass, that the third-floor baby is still. In front of the door, I squeeze through a group of children. They are going to play tag, and are counting to see who should be it. My mother and your mother went out to hang clothes. My mother gave your another a punch in the nose. If the children's couplet does not give a vivid picture of the life, manners, and customs of Dover Street, no description of mine can ever do so. Frida was married before we came to Dover Street, and went to live in East Boston. This left me the eldest of the children at home. Whether on this account, or because I was outgrowing my childish carelessness, 
or because I began to believe, on the cumulative evidence of the Crescent Beach, Chelsea, and Wheeler Street adventures, that America, after all, was not going to provide for my father's family. Whether for any or all of these reasons, I began at this time to take bread-and-butter matters more to heart, and to ponder ways and means of getting rich. My father saw employment wherever work was going on. His health was poor, he aged very fast. Nevertheless, he offered himself for every kind of labor, he offered himself for a boy's wages. Here he was found too weak, here too old, here his imperfect English was in the way, here his Jewish appearance. He had a few short terms of work at this or that. I do not know the name of the form of drudgery that my father did not practice. But all told, he did not earn enough to pay the rent in full and buy a bone for the soup. The only steady source of income, for I do not know what years, was my brother's earnings from his newspapers. Surely this was the time for me to take my sister's place in the workshop. I had had every fair chance until now. School, my time to myself, liberty to run and play and make friends. I had graduated from grammar school. I was of legal age to go to work. What was I doing, sitting at home and dreaming? I was minding my business, of course. With all my might I was minding my business. As I understood it, my business was to go to school, to learn everything there was to know to write poetry, become famous, and make the family rich. Surely it was not shirking to lay out such a program for myself. I had boundless faith in my future. I was certainly going to be a great poet. I was certainly going to take care of the family. Thus mused I, in my arrogance. And my family? They were as bad as I. My father had not lost a whit of his ambition for me. Since graduation day, and the school committee man's speech, and half a column about me in the paper— his ambition had soared even higher. He was going to keep me at school till I was prepared for college. By that time he was sure I would more than take care of myself. It never for a moment entered his head to doubt the wisdom or justice of this course. And my mother was just as loyal to my cause, and my brother, and my sister. It is no wonder if I got along rapidly. I was helped, encouraged, and upheld by every one. Even the baby cheered me on. When I asked her whether she believed in higher education, she answered without a moment's hesitation, Decca, decca, da! Against her I remember only that one day, when I read her a verse out of a most pathetic piece I was composing. She laughed right out, a most disrespectful laugh, for which I revenged myself by washing her face at the faucet and rubbing it red on the roller towel. It was just like me, when it was debated whether I would be best fitted for college at the high or the Latin school, to go in person to Mr. Tetlow, who was principal of both schools, and so get the most expert opinion on the subject. I never send a messenger, you may remember, where I can go myself. It was vacation time, and I had to find Mr. Tetlow at his home. Away out to the wilds of Roxbury, I found my way, perhaps half an hour's ride on the electric car from Dover Street. I grew an inch taller and broader between the corner of Cedar Street and Mr. Tetlow's house. Such was the charm of the clean, green suburb on a cramped waif from the slums. My faded calico dress, my rusty straw sailor hat, the color of my skin and all bespoke the waif, but never a bit daunted was I. I went up the steps to the porch, rang the bell, and asked for the great man with as much assurance as if I were a daily visitor on Cedar Street. I calmly awaited the appearance of Mr. Tetlow in the reception room, and stated my errand without trepidation. And why not? I was a solemn little person for the moment, earnestly seeking advice on a matter of great importance. That is what Mr. Tetlow saw, to judge by the gravity with which he discussed my business with me, and the courtesy with which he showed me to the door. He saw, too, I fancy, that I was not the least bit conscious of my shabby dress, and I am sure he did not smile at my appearance, even when my back was turned. A new life began for me when I entered the Latin school in September. Until then, I had gone to school with my equals, and as a matter of course. Now it was distinctly a feat for me to keep in school, and my schoolmates were socially so far superior to me that my poverty became conspicuous. The pupils of the Latin school, from the nature of the institution, are an aristocratic set. They come from refined homes, dress well, and spend the recess hour talking about parties, bows, and the matinee. As students, they are either very quick or very hard-working, for the course of study, in the lingo of the school world, is considered stiff. The girl with half her brain asleep, or with too many bows, drops out by the end of the first year. 
or a one and only bow may be the fatal element. At the end of the course the weeding process has reduced the once numerous tribe of academic candidates to a cozy little family. By all these tokens, I should have had serious business on my hands as a pupil in the Latin school, but I did not find it hard. To make myself letter-perfect in my lessons required long hours of study, but that was my delight. To make myself at home in an alien world was also within my talents. I had been practicing it day and night for the past four years. To remain unconscious of my shabby and ill-fitting clothes when the rustle of silk petticoats in the schoolroom protested against them was a matter still within my moral reach. Half a dress a year had been my allowance for many seasons, even less, for as I did not grow much I could wear my dresses as long as they lasted. And I had stood before editors, and exchanged polite calls with school teachers, untroubled by the detestable colors and archaic designs of my garments. To stand up and recite Latin declensions without trembling from hunger was something more of a feat, because I sometimes went to school with little or no breakfast. But even that required no special heroism. At most it was a matter of self-control. I had the advantage of a poor appetite, too. I really did not need much breakfast. Or if I was hungry it would hardly show. I coughed so much that my unsteadiness was self-explained. Everything helped, you see. My schoolmates helped. Aristocrats, though they were, they did not hold themselves aloof from me. Some of the girls who came to school in carriages were especially cordial. They rated me by my scholarship, and not by my father's occupation. They teased and admired me by turns for learning the footnotes in the Latin grammar by heart. They never reproached me for my ignorance of the latest comic opera. And it was more than good breeding that made them seem unaware of the incongruity of my presence. It was a generous appreciation of what it meant for a girl from the slums to be in the Latin school, on the way to college. If our intimacy ended on the steps of the schoolhouse, it was more my fault than theirs. Most of the girls were democratic enough to have invited me to their homes. Although to some, of course, I was impossible. But I had no time for visiting. Schoolwork and reading and family affairs occupied all the daytime, and much of the nighttime. I did not go with any of the girls, in the schoolgirl sense of the phrase. I admired some of them, either for good looks or beautiful manners, or more subtle attributes, but always at a distance. I discovered something inimitable in the way the Back Bay girls carried themselves, and I should have been the first to perceive the incongruity of Commonwealth Avenue and twining arms with Dover Street. Some day, perhaps, when I should be famous and rich, but not just then. So my companions and I parted on the steps of the schoolhouse, in mutual respect, they guiltless of snobbiness, I innocent of envy. It was a graciously American relation, and I am happy to this day to recall it. The one exception to this rule of friendly distance was my chum, Florence Connolly. But I should hardly have said chum. Florence and I occupied adjacent seats for three years. But we did not walk arm in arm, nor call each other nicknames, nor share our lunch nor correspond in vacation time. Florence was quiet as a mouse, and I was reserved as an oyster, and perhaps we two had no more in common fundamentally than those two creatures in their natural state. Still, as we were both very studious, and never strayed far from our desks at recess, we practiced a sort of intimacy of propiniquity. Although Florence was of my social order, her father presiding over a cheap lunchroom, I did not on that account feel especially drawn to her. I spent more time studying Florence than loving her, I suppose. And yet I ought to have loved her. She was such a good girl. Always perfect in her lessons. She was so modest that she recited in a noticeable tremor, and had to be told frequently to raise her voice. Florence wore her light brown hair brushed flatly back and braided in a single plait, at a time when pompadours were six inches high and braids hung in pairs. Florence had a pocket in her dress for her handkerchief, in a day when pockets were repugnant to fashion. All these things ought to have made me feel the kinship of humble circumstances, the comradeship of intellectual earnestness. But they did not. The truth is that my relation to persons and things depended neither on social distinctions, nor on intellectual or moral affinities. My attitude at this time was determined by my consciousness of the unique elements in my character and history. It seemed to me that I had been pursuing a single adventure since the beginning of the world, through highways and byways, underground, overground, by land, by sea, ever the same star had guided me, I thought, ever the same purpose had divided my affairs from other men's. What that purpose was, 
where the fixed horizon beyond which my star would not recede, was an absorbing mystery to me. But the current moment never puzzled me. What I chose instinctively to do, I knew to be right and in accordance with my destiny. I never hesitated over great things, but answered promptly to the call of my genius. So what was it to me whether my neighbor spurned or embraced me, if my way was no man's way? Nor should any one ever reject me whom I chose to be my friend, because I would make sure of a kindred spirit by the coincidence of our guiding stars. When, where, in the harem-scarum life of Dover Street, was there time or place for such self-communing? In the night, when everybody slept, on a solitary walk, as far from home as I dared to go. I was not unhappy on Dover Street, quite the contrary. Everything of consequence was well with me. Poverty was a superficial, temporary matter. It vanished at the touch of money. Money in America was plentiful. It was only a matter of getting some of it and I was on my way to the Mint. If Dover Street was not a pleasant place to abide in, it was only a wayside house. And I was really happy, actively happy, in the exercise of my mind in Latin, mathematics, history, and the rest, the things that suffice a studious girl in the middle teens. Still, I had moments of depression, when my whole being protested against the life of the slum. I resented the familiarity of my vulgar neighbors. I felt myself defiled by the indecencies I was compelled to witness. Then it was I took to running away from home. I went out in the twilight and walked for hours, my blind feet leading me. I did not care where I went. If I lost my way, so much the better. I never wanted to see Dover Street again. But behold, as I left the crowds behind, and the broader avenues were spanned by the open sky, my grievances melted away, and I fell to dreaming of things that neither hurt nor pleased. A fringe of trees against the sunset became suddenly the symbol of the whole world, and I stood and gazed and asked questions of it. The sunset faded, the trees withdrew, the wind went by, but dropped no hint in my ear. The evening star leaped out between the clouds and sealed the secret with a seal of splendor. A favorite resort of mine after dark was the South Boston Bridge, across South Bay and the old Colony Railroad. This was so near home that I could go there at any time when the confusion in the house drove me out, or I felt the need of fresh air. I liked to stand leaning on the bridge railing and look down on the dim tangle of railroad tracks below. I could barely see them branching out, elbowing, winding, and sliding out into the night in pairs. I was fascinated by the dotted lights, the significant red and green of signal lamps. These simple things stood for a complexity that it made me dizzy to think of. Then the blackness below me was split by the fiery eye of a monster engine. His breath enveloped me in blinding clouds. His long body shot by, rattling a hundred claws of steel. And he was gone, with an imperative shriek that shook me where I stood. So would I be, swift on my rightful business, picking out my proper track from the million that cross it, pausing for no obstacles, sure of my goal. After my watches on the bridge, I often stayed up to write or study. It is late before Dover Street begins to go to bed. It is past midnight before I feel that I am alone. Seated in my stiff little chair before my narrow table, I gather in the night sounds through the open window, curious to assort and define them. As, little by little, the city settles down to sleep, the volume of sound diminishes, and the qualities of particular sounds stand out. The electric car lurches by with silent gong, taking the empty track by leaps, humming to itself in the invisible distance, a benighted team swings restlessly around the corner, sharp under my rattling window panes. The staccato pelting of hoofs on the cobblestones changed suddenly to an even pounding on the bridge. A few pedestrians hurry by, their heavy boots all out of step. The distant thoroughfares have long ago ceased their murmur, and I know that a million lamps shine idly in the idle streets. My sister sleeps quietly in the little bed. The rhythmic dripping of a faucet is audible through the flat. It is so still that I can hear the paper crackling on the wall. Silence upon silence is added to the night. Only the kitchen clock is the voice of my brooding thoughts. Ticking, ticking, ticking. Suddenly the distant whistle of a locomotive breaks the stillness with a long-drawn wail. Like a threatened trouble, the sound comes nearer, piercingly near. Then it dies out in a mangled silence, complaining to the last. The sleepers stir in their beds. Somebody sighs, and the burden of all his trouble falls upon my heart. A homeless cat cries in the alley, 
in the voice of a human child. And the ticking of the kitchen clock is the voice of my troubled thoughts. Many things are revealed to me as I sit and watch the world asleep, but the silence asks me many questions that I cannot answer. And I am glad when the tide of sound begins to return, by little and little, and I welcome the clatter of tin cans that announces the milkman. I cannot see him in the dusk, but I know his wholesome face has no problem in it. It is one flight up to the roof. It is a leap of the soul to the sunrise. The morning mist rests lightly on chimneys and roofs and walls, wreaths the lamp posts, and floats in gauzy streamers down the streets. Distant buildings are massed like palace walls, with turrets and spires lost in the rosy clouds. I love my beautiful city spreading all about me. I love the world. I love my place in the world. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of the Promised Land – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Promised Land by Mary Anton. Chapter Seventeen – The Landlady From sunrise to sunset the day was long enough for many things besides school, which occupied five hours. There was time for me to try to earn my living, or at least the rent of our tenement. Rent was a standing trouble. We were always behind, and the landlady was very angry so I was particularly ambitious to earn the rent. I had had one or two poems published since the celebrated eulogy of George Washington, but nobody had paid for my poems, yet. I was coming to that, of course, but in the meantime I could not pay the rent with my writing. To be sure, my acquaintance with men of letters gave me an opening. A friend of mine introduced me to a slightly literary lady, who introduced me to the editor of the Boston Searchlight who offered me a generous commission for subscriptions to his paper. If our rent was three and one-half dollars per week, payable on strong demand, and the annual subscription to the searchlight was one dollar, and my commission was fifty per cent, how many subscribers did I need? How easy! Seven subscribers a week! One a day! Anybody could do that. Mr. James the editor said so. He said I could get two or three any afternoon between the end of school and supper. If I worked all Saturday, my head went dizzy computing the amount of my commissions. It would be rent and shoes and bonnets and everything for everybody. Bright and early one Saturday morning in the fall, I started out canvassing, in my hand a neatly folded copy of the searchlight. In my heart, faith in my lucky star and good will towards all the world. I began with one of the great office buildings on Tremont Street, as Mr. James had advised. The first half hour I lost, wandering through the corridors, reading the names on the doors. There were so many people in the same office. How should I know, when I entered, which was Wilson and Reed, solicitors, and which C. Jenkins Smith, mortgages and bonds? I decided that it did not matter. I would call them all Sir. I selected a door and knocked. After waiting some time, I knocked a little louder. The building buzzed with noise. Swift footsteps echoed on the stone floors. Snappy talk broke out with the opening of every door. Bells tinkled, elevators hummed. No wonder they did not hear me knock. But I noticed that other people went in without knocking, so after a while I did the same. There were several men and two women in the small, brightly lighted room. They were all busy. It was very confusing. Should I say, sir, to the roomful? Excuse me, sir, I began. That was a very good beginning, I felt sure, but I must speak louder. Lately my voice had been poor in school. Gave out sometimes in the middle of a recitation. I cleared my throat, but I did not repeat myself. The back of the bald head that I had addressed revolved and presented its compliment, a bald front. Will you, would you like, I'd like— I stared in dismay at the bald gentleman, unable to recall a word of what I meant to say, and he stared in impatience at me. Well, well, he snapped. What is it? What is it? That reminded me. It's the Boston searchlight, sir. I take sub— Take it away, take it away, we're busy here. He waved me away over his shoulder, the back of his head once more presented to me. I stole out of the room in great confusion. Was that the way I was going to be received? Why, Mr. James had said nobody would hesitate to subscribe. It was the best paper in Boston, the searchlight, and no businessman could afford to be without it. I must have made some blunder. Was mortgages and bonds a business? I'd never heard of it, and very likely I had spoken to C. Jenkins Smith. I must try again. Of course I must try again. I selected a real estate office next. A real estate broker, I knew for certain, was a businessman. 
Mr. George A. Hooker must just be waiting for the Boston searchlight. Mr. Hooker was indeed waiting, and he was telling Central about it. Yes, Central. Waiting. Waiting. What? Yes, yes. Ring for. What's that? Since when? Why didn't you say so at first, then, instead of keeping me on the line? What? Oh, is that so? Well, never mind this time, Central. I see. I see. All right. I had become so absorbed in this monologue that when Mr. Hooker swung around on me in his revolving chair, I was startled, feeling that I had been caught eavesdropping. I thought he was going to rebuke me, but he only said, "'What can I do for you, miss?' Encouraged by his forbearance, I said, "'Would you like to subscribe to the Boston Searchlight, sir?' "'Sir was safer, after all. It's a dollar a year.' I was supposed to say that it was the best paper in Boston, etc., but Mr. Hooker did not look interested, though he was not cross. "'No, thank you, miss. No new papers for me. Excuse me, I am very busy.' And he began to dictate to a stenographer. Well, that was not so bad. Mr. Hooker was at least polite. I must try to make a better speech next time. I stuck to real estate now. O'Lair and Kennedy were both in, in my next office, and both apparently enjoying a minute of relaxation, tilted back in their chairs behind a low railing. Said I, determined to be businesslike at last, and addressing myself to the whole firm. Would you like to subscribe to the Boston Searchlight? It's a very good paper. No business man can afford it, afford to be without it, I mean. It's only a dollar a year. Both men smiled at my break, and I smiled too. I wondered, would they subscribe separately, or would they take one copy for the firm? The Boston Searchlight, repeated one of the partners. Never heard of it. Is that the paper you have there? He unfolded the paper I gave him, looked it over, and handed it to his partner. Ever heard of the Searchlight, O'Lair? What do you think? Can we afford to be without it? I guess we'll make out somehow, replied Mr. O'Lair, handing me back my paper. "'But I'll buy this copy of you, miss,' he added, from second thoughts. "'And I'll go partner on the bargain,' said Mr. Kennedy. "'But I objected. "'This is a sample,' I said. "'I don't sell single papers. "'I take subscriptions for the year. "'It's one dollar. "'And no business man can afford it, you know,' Mr. Kennedy winked as he said it, "'and we all smiled again. "'It would have been stupid not to see the joke. "'I'm sorry I can't sell my sample,' I said, with my hand on the doorknob. "'That's all right, my dear,' said Mr. Kennedy, with a gracious wave of the hand. And his partner called after me. "'Better luck next door.' "'Well, I was getting on. The people grew friendlier all the time. But I skipped next door. It was mortgages and bonds. I tried insurance.' "'The best paper in Boston, is it?' remarked Mr. Thomas F. Dix, turning over my sample. "'And who told you that, young lady?' "'Mr. James,' was my prompt reply. "'Who is Mr. James?' The editor. Oh, I see. And do you also think the searchlight the best paper in Boston? I don't know, sir. I like the Herald much better, and the transcript. At that, Mr. Dix laughed. That's right, he said. Business is business, but you tell the truth. One dollar, is it? Here you are. My name is on the door. Good day. I think I spent twenty minutes copying the name and room number from the door. I did not trust myself to read plain English. What if I made a mistake, and the searchlight went astray, and good Mr. Dix remained unilluminated? He had paid for the year. It would be dreadful to make a mistake. Emboldened by my one success, I went into the next office, without considering the kind of business announced on the door. I tried brokers, lawyers, contractors, and all, just as they came around the corridor, but I copied no more addresses. Most of the people were polite. Some men waved me away, like C. Jenkins Smith. Some looked impatient at first, but excused themselves politely in the end. Almost everybody said, "'We're busy here,' as if they suspected I wanted them to read a whole year's issue of the searchlight at once. At last one man told me he did not think it was a nice business for a girl, going through the offices like that. This took me aback. I had not thought anything about the nature of the business. I only wanted the money to pay the rent.' I wandered through miles of stone corridors, unable to see why it was not a nice business, and yet reluctant to go on with it, with the doubt in my mind. Intent on my new problem, I walked into a messenger boy, and looking back to apologize to him, I collided softly with a cushion-shaped gentleman getting off an elevator. I was making up my mind to leave the building forever, when I saw an office door standing open. It was the first open door I had come across since morning. It was past noon now and it was a sign to me to keep on. I must not give up so easily. 
Mr. Frederick A. Strong was alone in the office, surreptitiously picking his teeth. He had been to lunch. He heard me out good-naturedly. "'How much is your commission, if I may ask?' It was the first thing he had said. Fifty cents, sir.' "'Well, I'll tell you what I will do. I don't care to subscribe, but here's a quarter for you.' If I did not blush, it was because it is not my habit. But all of a sudden I choked. A lump jumped into my throat. Almost the tears were in my eyes. That man was right who said it was not nice to go through the offices. I was taken for a beggar. A stranger offered me money for nothing. I could not say a word. I started to go out. But Mr. Strong jumped up and prevented me. "'Oh, don't go like that,' he cried. "'I didn't mean to offend you. Upon my word, I didn't. I beg your pardon. I didn't know. You see, won't you sit down a minute to rest? That's kind of you.' Mr. Strong was so genuinely repentant that I could not refuse him. Besides, I felt a little weak. I had been on my feet since morning, and had had no lunch. I sat down, and Mr. Strong talked. He showed me a picture of his wife and little girl, and said I must go and see them some time. Pretty soon I was chatting, too, and I told Mr. Strong about the Latin school. And, of course, he asked me if I was French, the way people always did when they wanted to say that I had a foreign accent. So we got started on Russia— and had such an interesting time that we both jumped up, surprised, when a fine young lady in a beautiful hat came in to take possession of the idle typewriter. Mr. Strong introduced me very formally, thanked me for an interesting hour, and shook hands with me at the door. I did not add his name to my short subscription list, but I counted it a greater triumph that I had made a friend. It would have been seeking an anticlimax to solicit any more in the building. I went out, into the roar of Tremont Street, and across the common, still green and leafy. I rested a while on a bench, debating where to go next. It was past two by the clock on Park Street Church. I had had a long day already, but it was too early to quit work, with only one half dollar of my own in my pocket. It was Saturday, and the evening the landlady would come. I must try a little longer. I went out along Columbus Avenue, a popular route for bicyclists at that time. The bicycle stores all along the way looked promising to me. The people did not look so busy as in the office building. They would at least be polite. They were not particularly rude, but they did not subscribe. Nobody wanted the searchlight. They had never heard of it. They made jokes about it. They did not want it at any price. I began to lose faith in the paper myself. I got tired of its name. I began to feel dizzy. I stopped going into the stores. I walked straight along, looking at nothing. I wanted to go back, go home, but I wouldn't. I felt like doing myself spite. I walked right along, straight as the avenue ran. I did not know where it would lead me. I did not care. Everything was horrid. I would go right on until night. I would get lost. I would fall in a faint on a strange doorstep, and be found dead in the morning, and be pitied. Wouldn't that be interesting? The adventure might even end happily. I might faint at the door of a rich old man's house who would take me in, and order his housekeeper to nurse me, just like in the story-books. In my delirium, of course I would have a fever, I would talk about the landlady, and how I had tried to earn the rent, and the old gentleman would wipe his spectacles for pity. Then I would wake up, and ask plaintively, Where am I? And when I got strong, after a delightfully long convalescence, the old gentleman would take me to Dover Street, in a carriage, and we would all be reunited, and laugh and cry together. The old gentleman, of course, would engage my father as his steward on the spot, and we would all go to live in one of his houses, with a garden around it. I walked on and on, gleefully aware that I had not eaten since morning. Wasn't I beginning to feel shaky? Yes, I should certainly faint before long. But I didn't like the houses I passed. They did not look fit for my adventure. I must keep up till I reached a better neighborhood. Anybody who knows Boston knows how cheaply my adventure ended. Columbus Avenue leads out to Roxbury Crossing. When I saw that the houses were getting shabbier, instead of finer, my heart sank. When I came out on the noisy, thrice commonplace streetcar center, my spirit collapsed utterly. I did not swoon. I woke up from my foolish, childish dream with a shock. I was disgusted with myself, and frightened besides. It was evening now, and I was faint and sick in good earnest and I did not know where I was. I asked a starter at the transfer station the way to Dover Street, and he told me to get on a car that was just coming in. "'I'll walk,' I said, "'if you will please tell me the shortest way. How could I spend five cents out of the little I had made?' But the starter discouraged me. 
"'You can't walk it before midnight, the way you look, my girl. "'Better hop on that car before it goes.' "'I could not resist the temptation. "'I rode home in the car and felt like a thief when I paid the fare. Five cents gone to pay for my folly. "'I was grateful for a cold supper, "'thrice grateful to hear that Mrs. Hutch, the landlady, "'had been and gone, content with two dollars that my father had brought home. "'Mrs. Hutch seldom succeeded in collecting the full amount of the rents from her tenants.' I suppose that made the bookkeeping complicated, which must have been wearing on her nerves, and hence her temper. We lived on Dover Street, in fear of her temper. Saturday had a distinct quality about it, derived from the imminence of Mrs. Hutch's visit. Of course, I awoke on Saturday morning with a no-school feeling, but the grim thing that leaped to its feet and glowered down on me, while the rest of my consciousness was still yawning on its back, was the Mrs. Hutch's coming and there's no rent feeling. It is hard, if you are a young girl, full of life, and inclined to be glad, to go to sleep in anxiety and awake in fear. It is apt to interfere with the circulation of the vital ether of happiness in the young, which is damaging to the complexion of the soul. It is bitter, when you are middle-aged and unsuccessful, to go to sleep in self-reproach and awake unexonerated. It is likely to cause fermentation in the sweetest nature. It is certain to breed gray hairs and a premature longing for death. It is pitiful, if you are the home-keeping mother of an impoverished family, to drop in your traces helpless at night, and awake unstrengthened in the early morning. The haunting consciousness of rooted poverty is an improper bedfellow for a woman who still bears. It has been known to induce physical and spiritual malformations in the babies she nurses. It did require strength to lift a burden of life in the gray morning on Dover Street, especially on Saturday morning. Perhaps my mother's pack was the heaviest to lift. To the man of the house, poverty is a bulky dragon with gripping talons and a poisonous breath, but he bellows in the open, and it is possible to give him nightly battle, with the full swing of the angry arm that cuts to the enemy's vitals. To the housewife, want is an insidious myriapod creature that crawls in the dark, mates with its own offspring, breeds all the year round, persists like leprosy. The woman has an endless, inglorious struggle with the pest, her triumphs are too petty for applause, her failures too mean for notice. Care to the man is a hound to be kept in leash and mastered. To the woman, care is a secret parasite that infects the blood. Mrs. Hutch, of course, was only one symptom of the disease of poverty, but there were times when she seemed to me the sharpest tooth of the gnawing canker. Surely as sorrow trails behind sin, Saturday evening brought Mrs. Hutch. The landlady did not trail. Her movements were anything but impassive. She climbed the stairs with determination, and landed at the top with emphasis. Her knock on the door was clear, sharp, unfaltering. It was impossible to pretend not to hear it. Her good evening announced business. Her manner of taking a chair suggested the throwing down of the gauntlet. Invariably she asked for my father, calling him Mr. Anton, and refusing to be corrected. Almost invariably he was not at home, was looking for work, had he left her the rent? My mother's gentle, no, ma'am, was a signal for the storm. I do not want to repeat what Mrs. Hutch said. It would be hard on her, and hard on me. She grew red in the face, her voice grew shriller with every word. My poor mother hung her head where she stood. The children stared from their corners. The frightened baby cried. The angry landlady rehearsed our sins like a prophet foretelling doom. We owed so many weeks' rent. We were too lazy to work. We never intended to pay. We lived on others. We deserve to be put out without warning. She reproached my mother for having too many children. She blamed us all for coming to America. She enumerated her losses through non-payment of her rents, told us that she did not collect the amount of her taxes, showed us how our irregularities were driving a poor widow to ruin. My mother did not attempt to excuse herself. But when Mrs. Hutch began to rail against my absent father, she tried to put in a word in his defense. The landlady grew all the shriller at that, and silenced my mother impatiently. Sometimes she addressed herself to me. I always stood by, if I was at home, to give my mother the moral support of my dumb sympathy. I understood that Mrs. Hutch had a special grudge against me, because I did not go to work as a cash girl and earn three dollars a week. I wanted to explain to her how I was preparing myself for a great career, and I was ready to promise her the payment of the arrears as soon as I began to get rich. But the landlady would not let me put in a word, and I was sorry for her, 
because she seemed to be having such a bad time. At last Mrs. Hutch got up to leave, marching out as determinedly as she had marched in. At the door she turned, in undiminished wrath, to shoot her parting dart. And if Mr. Anton does not bring me the rent on Monday, I will serve notice of eviction on Tuesday, without fail. We breathed when she was gone. My mother wiped away a few tears, and went to the baby, crying in the windowless, airtight room. I was the first to speak. "'Isn't she queer, Mama? I said. "'She never remembers how to say our name. "'She insists on saying Anton, Anton. "'Celia, say Anton.' "'And I made the baby laugh by imitating the landlady, "'who had made her cry. "'But when I went to my little room, "'I did not mock Mrs. Hutch. "'I thought about her, thought long and hard, and to a purpose. "'I decided that she must hear me out once. "'She must understand about my plans, "'my future, my good intentions. "'It was too irrational to go on like this.' We living in fear of her, she in distrust of us. If Mrs. Hutch would only trust me, and the tax collectors would trust her, we could all live happily forever. I was the more certain that my argument would prevail with the landlady, if only I could make her listen, because I understood her point of view. I even sympathized with her. What she said about the babies, for instance, was not all unreasonable to me. There was this last baby, my mother's sixth, born on Mrs. Hutch's premises, Yes, in the windowless, airtight bedroom. Was there any need of this baby? When May was born two years earlier on Wheeler Street, I had accepted her. After a while, I even welcomed her. She was born an American, and it was something to me to have one genuine American relative. I had to sit up with her the whole of her first night on earth, and I questioned her about the place she came from, and so we got acquainted. As my mother was so ill that my sister Frida, who was a nurse, and the doctor from the dispensary had all they could do to take care of her, the baby remained in my charge a good deal, and so I got used to her. But when Celia came I was two years older, and my outlook was broader. I could see around a baby's charms, and discern the disadvantages of possessing the baby. I was supplied with all kinds of relatives now. I had a brother-in-law, and an American-born nephew, who might become a president. Moreover, I knew there was not enough to eat before the baby's advent, and she did not bring any supplies with her that I could see. The baby was one too many. There was no need of her. I resented her existence. I recorded my resentment in my journal. I was pleased with my broad-mindedness that enabled me to see all sides of the baby question. I could regard even the rent question disinterestedly, like a philosopher reviewing natural phenomena, it seemed not unreasonable that Mrs. Hutch should have a craving for the rent as such. A schoolgirl dotes on her books, a baby cries for its rattle, and a landlady yearns for her rents. I could easily believe that it was doing Mrs. Hutch spiritual violence to withhold the rent from her, and hence the vehemence with which she pursued the arrears. Yes, I could analyze the landlady very nicely. I was certainly qualified to act as a peacemaker between her and my family, but I must go to her own house, and not on a rent day. Saturday evening, when she was embittered by many disappointments, was no time to reproach her with diplomatic negotiations. I must go to her house on a day of good omen. And I went, as soon as my father could give me a week's rent to take along. I found Mrs. Hutch in the gloom of a long, faded parlor. Divested of the ample black coat and widow's bonnet in which I had always seen her, her presence would have been less formidable, had I not been conscious that I was a mere rumpled sparrow fallen into the lion's den. When I had delivered the money, I should have begun my speech. But I did not know what came first of all there was to say. While I hesitated, Mrs. Hutch observed me. She noticed my books and asked about them. I thought this was my opening, and I showed her eagerly my Latin grammar, my geometry, my Virgil. I began to tell her how I was to go to college, to fit myself to write poetry and get rich and pay the arrears. But Mrs. Hutch cut me short at the mention of college. She broke out with her old reproaches, and worked herself into a worse fury than I had ever witnessed before. I was all alone in the tempest, and a very old lady was sitting on a sofa, drinking tea, and the tidy on the back of the sofa was sliding down. I was so bewildered by the suddenness of the onslaught, I felt so helpless to defend myself, that I could only stand and stare at Mrs. Hutch. She kept on railing without stopping for breath, repeating herself over and over. At last I ceased to hear what she said. I became hypnotized by the rapid motions of her mouth. Then the moving tidy caught my eye, and the spell was broken. I went over to the sofa with a decided step, and carefully replaced the tidy. 
It was now the landlady's turn to stare, and I stared back, surprised at my own action. The old lady also stared, her teacup suspended under her nose. The whole thing was so ridiculous. I had come on such a grand mission, ready to dictate the terms of a noble peace. I was met with anger and contumely. The dignity of the ambassador of peace rubbed off at a touch, like the golden dust from the butterfly's wing. I took my scolding like a meek child. And then, when she was in the middle of a trenchant phrase, her eye fixed dagger-like on mine, I calmly went to put the enemy's house in order. It was ridiculous, and I laughed. Immediately I was sorry. I wanted to apologize, but Mrs. Hutch didn't give me a chance. If she had been harsh before, she was terrific now. Did I come there to insult her? she wanted to know. Wasn't it enough that I and my family lived on her, that I must come to her on purpose to rile her with my talk about college? College, these beggars, and laugh in her face. What did you come for? Who sent you? Why do you stand there staring? Say something. College, these beggars, and do you think I'll keep you till you go to college? You, learning geometry. Did you ever figure out how much rent your father owes me? You were all too lazy. Don't say a word. Don't speak to me. Coming here to laugh in my face. I don't believe you can say one sensible word. Latin. And French. Oh, these beggars. You ought to go to work. If you know enough to do one sensible thing. College. Go home and tell your father never to send you again. Laughing in my face and staring. Why don't you say something? How old are you? Mrs. Hutch actually stopped, and I jumped into the pause. I'm seventeen, I said quickly, and I feel like seventy. This was too much, even for me who had spoken. I had not meant to say the last. It broke out, like my wicked laugh. I was afraid, if I stayed any longer, Mrs. Hutch would have the apoplexy, and I felt that I was going to cry. I moved towards the door, but the landlady got in another speech before I had escaped. Seventeen, seventy, and looks like twelve. The child is silly, can't even tell her own age. No wonder, with her Latin and French and— I did cry when I got outside, and I didn't care if I was noticed. What was the use of anything? Everything I did was wrong. Everything I tried to do for Mrs. Hutch turned out bad. I tried to sell papers for the sake of the rent, and nobody wanted the searchlight, and I was told it was not a nice business. I wanted to take her into my confidence, and she wouldn't hear a word, but scolded and called me names. She was an unreasonable, ungrateful landlady. I wish she would put us out. Then we should be rid of her. But wasn't it funny about that tidy? What made me do that? I never meant to. Curious, the way we sometimes do things we don't want to at all. The old lady must be deaf. She didn't say anything all that time. Oh, I have a whole book of the Aeneid to review, and it's getting late. I must hurry home. It was impossible to remain despondent long. The landlady came only once a week, I reflected, as I walked home, and the rest of the time I was surrounded by friends. Everybody was good to me, at home, of course, and at school, and there was Miss Dillingham, and her friend who took me out in the country to see the autumn leaves, and her friend's friend who lent me books, and Mr. Hurd, who put my poems in the transcript, and gave me books almost every time I came, and a dozen others who did something good for me all the time, besides the several dozen who wrote me such nice letters. Friends, if I named one for every block I passed, I should not get through before I reached home. There was Mr. Strong, too, and he wanted me to meet his wife and little girl. And Mr. Pastor. I had almost forgotten Mr. Pastor. I arrived at the corner of Washington and Dover Streets on my way home, and looked into Mr. Pastor's showy drug store as I passed, and that reminded me of the history of my latest friendship. My cough had been pretty bad, kept me awake nights. My voice gave out frequently. The teachers had spoken to me several times, suggesting that I ought to see a doctor. Of course, the teachers did not know that I could not afford a doctor, but I could go to the free dispensary, and I did. They told me to come again, and again, and I lost precious hours sitting in the waiting room, watching for my turn. I was examined, thumped, studied, and sent out with prescriptions and innumerable directions. All that was said about food, fresh air, sunny rooms, etc., was of course impossible, but I would try the medicine. A bottle of medicine was a definite thing with a fixed price. You either could or could not afford it on a given day. Once you began with milk and eggs and such things, there was no end of it. You were always going around the corner for more, till the grocer said he could give no more credit. No, the medicine bottle was the only safe thing. I had taken several bottles, and was told that I was looking better, when I went one day to have my prescription renewed. 
It was just after a hard rain, and the pools on the broken pavements were full of blue sky. I was delighted with the beautiful reflections. There were even white clouds moving across the blue, there at my feet on the pavement. I walked with my head down all the way to the drug store, which was all right, but I should not have done it going back with the new bottle of medicine in my hand. In front of a cigar store, halfway between Washington Street and Harrison Avenue, stood a wooden Indian with a package of wooden cigars in his hand. My eyes on the shining rain pools, I walked plump into the Indian, and the bottle was knocked out of my hand and broke with a crash. I was horrified at the catastrophe. The medicine cost fifty cents. My mother had given me the last money in the house. I must not be without my medicine. The dispensary doctor was very emphatic about that. It would be dreadful to get sick and have to stay out of school. What was to be done? I made up my mind in less than five minutes. I went back to the drug store and asked for Mr. Pastor himself. He knew me. He often sold me postage stamps and joked about my large correspondence and heard a good deal about my friends. He came out on this occasion from his little office in the back of the store, and I told him of my accident and that there was no more money at home and asked him to give me another bottle to be paid for as soon as possible. My father had a job as a night watchman in a store. I should be able to pay very soon. Certainly, my dear, certainly, said Mr. Pastor. Very glad to oblige you. It's doing you good, isn't it? That's right. You're such a studious young lady with all those books and so many letters to write. You need something to build you up. There you are. Oh, don't mention it. Any time at all. And look out for wild Indians. Of course, we were great friends after that. And this is the way my troubles often ended on Dover Street. To bump into a wooden Indian was to bump into good luck a hundred times a week. No wonder I was happy most of the time. End of chapter 17. Chapter 18 of The Promised Land. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Promised Land by Mary Anton. Chapter 18. The Burning Bush. Just when Mrs. Hutch was most worried about the error of my ways, I entered on a new chapter of adventures, even more remote from the cash girl's career than Latin and geometry. But I ought not to name such harsh things as landladies at the opening of the fairy story of my girlhood. I have reached what was the second transformation of my life, as truly as my coming to America was the first great transformation. Robert Louis Stevenson, in one of his delightful essays, credits the lover with a feeling of remorse and shame at the contemplation of that part of his life which he lived without his beloved, content with his barren existence. It is with just such a feeling of remorse that I look back to my bookworm days, before I began to study the natural history outdoors, and with a feeling of shame akin to the lover's I confess how late in my life nature took the first place in my affections. The subject of nature study is better developed in the public schools today than it was in my time. I remember my teacher in the Chelsea Grammar School, who encouraged us to look for different kinds of grasses in the empty lots near home, and to bring school samples of the cereals we found in our mother's pantries. I brought the grasses and cereals, as I did everything else the teacher ordered, but I was content when nature study was over and the arithmetic lesson began. I was not interested, and the teacher did not make it interesting. In the boys' books I was fond of reading, I came across all sorts of heroes, and I sympathized with them all. The boy who ran away to sea, the boy who delighted in the society of ranchmen and cowboys, the stage-struck boy whose ambition was to drive a pasteboard chariot in a circus, the boy who gave up his holidays in order to earn money for books, the bad boy who played tricks on people, the clever boy who invented amusing toys for his blind little sister. All these boys I admired. I could put myself in the place of any one of these heroes and delight in their delights. But there was one sort of hero I never could understand, and that was the boy whose favorite reading was natural history, who kept an aquarium, collected beetles, and knew all about a man by the name of Agassi. This style of boy always had a seafaring uncle or a missionary aunt who sent him all sorts of queer things from China and the South Sea Islands and the conversation between this boy and the seafaring uncle home on a visit, I was perfectly willing to skip. The impossible hero usually kept snakes in a box in the barn, where his little sister was fond of playing with her little friends. 
The snakes escaped at least once before the end of the story, and the things the boy said to the frightened little girls, about the harmless and fascinating qualities of snakes, was something I had no patience to read. No, I did not care for natural history. I would read about travels, about deserts, and nameless islands and strange peoples. But snakes and birds and minerals and butterflies did not interest me in the least. I visited the Natural History Museum once or twice, because it was my way to enter every open door, so as to miss nothing that was free to the public. But the curious monsters that filled the glass cases and adorned the walls and ceilings failed to stir my imagination, and the slimy things that floated in glass vessels were too horrid for a second glance. Of all the horrid things that ever passed under my eyes when I lifted my nose from my book, spiders were the worst. Mice were bad enough, and so were flies and worms and june bugs. But spiders were absolutely the most loathsome creatures I knew. And yet it was the spider that opened my eyes to the wonders of nature, and touched my girlish happiness with the hues of the infinite. And it happened at Hale House. It was not Dr. Hale, though it might have been, who showed me the way to the settlement house on Garland Street which bears his name. Hale House is situated in the midst of a labyrinth of narrow streets and alleys that constitutes the slum of which Harrison Avenue is the backbone, and of which Dover Street is a member. Bearing in mind the fact that there are almost no playgrounds in all this congested district, you will understand that Hale House has plenty of work on its hands to carry a little sunshine into the grimy tenement homes. The beautiful story of how that is done cannot be told here, but what Hale House did for me I may not omit to mention. It was my brother Joseph who discovered Hale House. He started a debating club, and invited his chums to help him settle the problems of the Republic on Sunday afternoon. The club held its first session in our empty parlor on Dover Street, and the United States government was in a fair way to be put on a sound basis at last, when the numerous babies belonging to our establishment broke up the meeting leaving the administration in suspense as to its future course. The next meeting was held in Isaac Malinsky's parlor, and the orators were beginning to jump to their feet and shake their fists at each other, in excellent parliamentary form, when Mrs. Malinsky sallied in to smile at the boys' excitement. But at the sight of seven pairs of boys' boots scuffling on her cherished parlor carpet, the fringed cover of the center table hanging by one corner, and the plush photograph album unceremoniously laid aside, Indignation took the place of good humor in Mrs. Malinsky's ample bosom, and she ordered the boys to clear out, threatening Ike with dire vengeance if ever again he ventured to enter the parlor with ungentle purpose. On the following Sunday, Harry Rubenstein offered the club the hospitality of his parlor, and the meeting began satisfactorily. The subject on the table was the tariff, and the pros and antes were about evenly divided. Congress might safely have taken a nap, with the Hub Debating Club to handle its affairs, if Harry Rubenstein's big brother Jake had not interfered. He came out of the kitchen, where he had been stuffing the baby with peanuts, and stood in the doorway of the parlor and winked at the dignified chairman. The chairman turned his back on him, whereupon Jake pelted him with peanut shells. He mocked the speakers and called them kids, and wanted to know how they could tell the tariff from a sunstroke anyhow. "'We've got to have free trade,' he mocked. "'Pa, listen to the kids. "'In the interests of the American laborer. "'Hooray, listen to the kids, Pa.' "'Flesh and blood could not bear this. "'The political reformers adjourned indefinitely, "'and the club was in danger of extinction "'for want of a sheltering roof, "'when one of the members discovered that Hale House, "'on Garland Street, was waiting to welcome the club. "'How the debating club prospered "'in the genial atmosphere of the settlement house.' How from a little club it grew to be a big club, as the little boys became young men. How Joseph and Isaac and Harry and the rest won prizes in public debates. How they came to be a part of the multiple influence for good that issues from Garland Street. All this is a piece of the history of Hale House, whose business in the slums is to mold the restless children on the street corners into noble men and women. I brought the debating club into my story, just to show how naturally the children of the slums drift toward their salvation, if only some island of safety lies in the course of their innocent activities. Not a child in the slum is born to be lost. They are all born to be saved, and the raft that carries them unharmed through the perilous torrent of tenement life is the child's unconscious aspiration for the best. But there must be lighthouses to guide him midstream. 
Dora followed Joseph to Hale House, joining a club for little girls which has since become famous in the Hale House district. The leader of this club, under pretense of teaching the little girls the proper way to sweep and make beds, artfully teaches them how to beautify a tenement home by means of noble living. Joseph and Dora were so enthusiastic about Hale House that I had to go over and see what it was all about. And I found the Natural History Club. I do not know how Miss Black, who was then the resident, persuaded me to try the Natural History Club, in spite of my aversion for bugs. I suppose she tried me in various girls' clubs, and found that I did not fit, any more than I fitted in the dancing club that I attempted years before. I dare say she decided that I was an old maid, and urged me to come to the meetings of the Natural History Club, which was composed of adults. The members of this club were not people from the neighborhood I understood, but workers at Hill House and their friends, and they often had eminent naturalists, travelers, and other notables lecture before them. My curiosity to see a real live naturalist probably induced me to accept Mrs. Black's invitation in the end, for up to that time I had never met any one who enjoyed the creepy society of snakes and worms, except in books. The Natural History Club sat in a ring around the reception room, facing the broad doorway of the adjoining room. Mrs. Black introduced me, and I said, Glad to meet you, all around the circle, and sat down in a kindergarten chair beside the piano. It was Friday evening, and I had the sense of leisure which pervades the schoolgirl's consciousness when there is to be no school on the morrow. I liked the pleasant room, pleasanter than any at home. I liked the faces of the company I was in. I was prepared to have an agreeable evening, even if I was a little bored. The tall, lean gentleman with the frank blue eyes got up to read the minutes of the last meeting. I did not understand what he read, but I noticed that it gave him great satisfaction. This man had greeted me as if he had been waiting for my coming all his life. What did Mrs. Black call him? He looked and spoke as if he was happy to be alive. I liked him. Oh, yes. This was Mr. Winthrop. I let my thoughts wander, with my eyes, all around the circle, trying to read the characters of my new friends in their faces. But suddenly my attention was arrested by a word. Mr. Winthrop had finished reading the minutes, and was introducing the speaker of the evening. We are fortunate in having with us Mr. Emerson, whom we all know as an authority on spiders. Spiders! What hard luck! Mr. Winthrop pronounced the word spiders with unmistakable relish, as if he doted on the horrid creatures. But I— My nerves contracted into a tight knot. I gripped the arms of my little chair, determined not to run, with all those strangers looking on. I watched Mr. Emerson, to see when he would open a box of spiders— I recalled a hideous experience of long ago, when putting on a dress that had hung on the wall for weeks, I felt a thing with a hundred legs crawling down my bare arm, and shook a spider out of my sleeve. I watched the lecturer, but I was not going to run. It was too bad that Mrs. Black had not warned me. After a while, I realized that the lecturer had no menagerie in his pockets. He talked, in a familiar way, about different kinds of spiders and their ways, and as he talked, he wove across the doorway, where he stood, a gigantic spider's web, unwinding a ball of twine in his hand, and looping various lengths on invisible tacks he had ready in the doorframe. I was fascinated by the progress of the web. I forgot my terrors. I began to follow Mr. Emerson's discourse. I was surprised to hear how much there was to know about a dusty little spider, besides that he could spin his webs as fast as my broom could sweep them away. The drama of the spider's daily life became very real to me as the lecturer went on. His struggle for existence, his wars with his enemies, his wiles, his traps, his patient labors, the intricate safeguards of his simple existence, the fitness of his body for his surroundings, of his instincts for his vital needs. The whole picture of the spider's pursuit of life, under the direction of definite laws, filled me with a great wonder, and left no room in my mind for repugnance or fear. It was the first time the natural history of a living creature had been presented to me under such circumstances that I could not avoid hearing and seeing, and I was surprised at my dullness in the past, when I had rejected books on natural history. I did not become an enthusiastic amateur naturalist at once. I did not at once begin to collect worms and bugs. But on the next sweeping day I stood on a chair, craning my neck, to study the spider webs I discovered in the corners of the ceiling, and one or two webs of more than ordinary perfection I suffered to remain undisturbed for weeks, 
although it was my duty as a house-cleaner to sweep the ceiling clean. I began to watch for the mice that were wont to scurry across the floor when the house slept and I alone waked. I even placed a crust for them on the threshold of my room, and cultivated a breathless intimacy with them, when the little grey beast acknowledged my hospitality by nibbling my crust in full sight, and so by degrees I came to a better understanding of my animal neighbours on all sides, and I began to look forward to the meetings of the Natural History Club. The club had frequent field excursions, in addition to the regular meetings, at the seashore, in the woods, in the fields, at high tide and low tide, in summer and winter, by sunlight and by moonlight. The marvellous story of orderly nature was revealed to me, in fragments that allured the imagination and made me beg for more. Some of the members of the club were school teachers, accustomed to answering questions. All of them were patient. Some of them took special pains with me. But nobody took me seriously as a member of the club. They called me the club mascot, and appointed me curator of the club museum, which was not in existence, at a salary of ten cents a year, which was never paid, and I was well pleased with my unique position in the club, delighted with my new friends, and raptured with my new study. More and more, as the seasons rolled by, and page after page of the book of nature was turned before my eager eyes, did I feel the wonder and thrill of the revelations of science, till all my thoughts became colored with the tints of infinite truths. My days arranged themselves around the meetings of the club as a center. The whole structure of my life was transfigured by my novel experiences outdoors. I realized, with a shock at first, but afterwards with complacency, that books were taking a secondary place in my life, my irregular studies in natural history holding the first place. I began to enjoy the natural history rooms, and I was obliged to admit to myself that my heart hung with a more thrilling suspense over the fate of some beans I had planted in a window-box than over the fortunes of the classic hero about whom we were reading at school. But for all my enthusiasm about animals, plants, and rocks, for all my devotion to the natural history club, I did not become a thorough naturalist. My scientific friends were right not to take me seriously. Mr. Winthrop, in his delightfully frank way, called me a fraud, and I did not resent it. I dipped into zoology, botany, geology, ornithology, and an infinite number of other ologies, as the activities of the club, or of particular members of it, gave me opportunity, but I made no systematic study of any branch of science, at least not until I went to college. For what enthralled my imagination in the whole subject of natural history— was not the orderly array of facts, but the glimpse I caught, through this or that fragment of science, of the grand principles underlying the facts. By asking questions, by listening when my wise friends talked, by reading, by pondering and dreaming, I slowly gathered toward the kaleidoscopic bits of the stupendous panorama which is painted in the literature of Darwinism. Everything I had ever learned at school was illumined by this new knowledge. The world lay newly made under my eyes, Vastly as my mind had stretched to embrace the idea of a great country, when I exchanged Polotsk for America, it was no such enlargement as I now experienced, when in place of the measurable earth, with its paltry tale of historic centuries, I was given the illimitable universe to contemplate, with the numberless aeons of infinite time. As the meaning of nature was deepened for me, so was its aspect beautified. Hitherto I had loved in nature the spectacular, the blazing sunset, the whirling tempest, the flush of summer, the snow-wonder of winter. Now, for the first time, my heart was satisfied with the microscopic perfection of a solitary blossom. The harmonious murmur of autumn woods broke up into a hundred separate melodies, as the pelting acorn, the scurrying squirrel, the infrequent chirp of the lingering cricket— and the soft speed of ripe pine-cones through dense-grown branches, each struck its discriminate chord in the scented air. The outdoor world was magnified in every dimension. Inanimate things were vivified. Living things were dignified. No two persons set the same value on any given thing, and so it may very well be that I am boasting of the enrichment of my life through the study of natural history to ears that hear not. I need only recall my own obtuseness to the subject, before the story of the spider sharpened my senses, to realize that these confessions of a nature lover may bore every other person who reads them. But I do not pretend to be concerned about the reader at this point. 
I never hope to explain to my neighbor the exact value of a winter sunrise in my spiritual economy. But I know that my life has grown better since I learned to distinguish between a butterfly and a moth, that my faith in man is the greater because I have watched for the coming of the song sparrow in the spring, and my thoughts of immortality are the less wavering because I have cherished the winter duckweed on my lawn. Those who find their greatest intellectual and emotional satisfaction in the study of nature are apt to refer their spiritual problems also to science. That is how it went with me. Long before my introduction to natural history I had realized, with an uneasy sense of the breaking of peace, that the questions which I thought to have been settled years before were beginning to tease me anew. In Russia I had practiced a prescribed religion, with little faith in what I professed, and a restless questioning of the universe. When I came to America I lightly dropped the religious forms that I had half mocked before, and contented myself with a few novel phrases employed by my father in his attempt to explain the riddle of existence. The busy years flew by, when from morning till night I was preoccupied with the process of becoming an American, and no question arose in my mind that my books or my teachers could not fully answer. Then came a time when the ordinary business of my girl's life discharged itself automatically, and I had leisure once more to look over and around things. This period coinciding with my moody adolescence, I rapidly entangled myself in a net of doubts and questions, after the well-known manner of a growing girl. I asked once more, How did I come to be? And I found that I was no whit wiser than poor Reb Lebe, whom I had despised for his ignorance. For all my years of America and schooling, I could give no better answer to my clamoring questions than the teacher of my childhood. Whence came the fair world? Was there a God after all? And if so, what did he intend when he made me? It was always my way, if I wanted anything, to turn my daily life into a pursuit of that thing. Have you seen the treasure I seek? I asked of every man I met. And if it was God that I desired... I made all my friends search their hearts for evidence of his being. I asked all the wise people I knew what they were going to do with themselves after death. And if the wise failed to satisfy me, I questioned the simple, and listened to the babies talking in their sleep. Still, the imperative clamor of my mind remained unallayed. Was all my life to be a hunger and a questioning? I complained of my teachers, who stuffed my heads with facts, and gave my soul no crumb to feed on. I blamed the stars for their silence. I sat up nights brooding over the emptiness of knowledge, and praying for revelations. Sometimes I lived for days in a chimera of doubts, feeling that it was hardly worth while living at all if I was never to know why I was born, and why I could not live forever. It was in one of these prolonged moods that I heard that a friend of mine, a distinguished man of letters whom I greatly admired, was coming to Boston for a short visit. A terrific New England blizzard arrived some hours in advance of my friend's train, but so intent was I on questioning him that I disregarded the weather and struggled through towering snowdrifts in the teeth of the wild wind to the railroad station. There I nearly perished of weariness while waiting for the train, which was delayed by the storm. But when my friend emerged from one of the snow-crusted cars I was rewarded, for the blizzard had kept the reporters away, and the great man could give me his undivided attention. No doubt he understood the pressing importance of the matter to me, from the trouble I had taken to secure an early interview with him. He heard me out very soberly, and answered my questions as honestly as a thinking man could. Not a word of what he said remains in my mind, but I remember going away with the impression that it was possible to live without knowing everything after all, and that I might even try to be happy in a world full of riddles. In such ways as this I sought peace of mind, but I never achieved more than a brief truce. I was coming to believe that only the stupid could be happy, and that life was pretty hard on the philosophical, when the great new interest of science came into my life, and scattered my blue devils as the sun scatters the night damps. Some of my friends in the Natural History Club were deeply versed in the principles of evolutionary science, and were able to guide me in my impetuous rush to learn everything in a day. I was in a hurry to deduce, from the conglomeration of isolated facts that I picked up in the lectures, the final solution of all my problems. It took both patience and wisdom to check me, and at the same time satisfy me, I have no doubt. But then I was always fortunate in my friends. 
wisdom and patience in plenty were spent on me, and I was instructed and inspired and comforted. Of course my wisest teacher was not able to tell me how the original spark of life was kindled, nor to point out, on the starry map of heaven, my future abode. The bread of absolute knowledge I do not hope to taste in this life, but all creation was remodeled on a grander scale by the utterances of my teachers, and my problems, though they deepened with the expansion of all nameable phenomena, were carried up to the heights of the impersonal, and ceased to torment me. Seeing how life and death, beginning and end, were all parts of the process of being, it mattered less in what particular ripple of the flux of existence I found myself. If past time was a trooping of similar yesterdays, back over the unbroken millenniums, to the first moment, it was simple to think of future time as a trooping of knowable todays, on and on, to infinity. Possibly, also, the spark of life that had persisted through the geological ages, under a million million disguises, was vital enough to continue for another earth age, in some shape as potent as the first or last. Thinking in eons and in races, instead of in years and individuals, somehow lightened the burden of intelligence, and filled me anew with a sense of youth and well-being, that I had almost lost in the pit of my narrow personal doubts. No one who understands the nature of youth will be misled, by this summary of my intellectual history, into thinking that I actually arranged my newly acquired scientific knowledge into any such orderly philosophy as, for the sake of clearness, I have outlined above. I had long passed my teens, and had seen something of life that is not revealed to poetizing girls, before I could give any logical account of what I read in the book of Cosmogony. But the high peaks of the promised land of evolution did flash on my vision in the earlier days, and with these to guide me I rebuilt the world, and found it much nobler than it had ever been before, and took great comfort in it. I did not become a finished philosopher from hearing a couple of hundred lectures on scientific subjects. I did not even become a finished woman. If anything, I grew rather more girlish. I remember myself as very merry in the midst of my serious scientific friends, and I can think of no time when I was more inclined to play the tomboy than when off for a day in the woods, in quest of botanical and zoological specimens. The freedom of outdoors, the society of congenial friends, the delight of my occupation, all acted as a strong wine on my mood, and sent my spirits soaring to immoderate heights. I am very much afraid I made myself a nuisance at times, to some of the more sedate of my grown-up companions. I wish they could know that I have truly repented. I wish they had known, at the time, that it was the exuberance of my happiness that played tricks, and no wicked desire to annoy kind friends. But I am sure that those who were offended have long since forgotten or forgiven, and I need remember nothing of those wonderful days, other than that a new sun rose above a new earth for me, and that my happiness was like unto the iridescent dews. End of chapter 18「Chapter nineteen of the Promised Land. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Promised Land by Mary Anton. Chapter nineteen. A Kingdom in the Slums. I did not always wait for the Natural History Club to guide me to delectable lands. Some of the happiest days of that happy time I spent with my sister in East Boston. We had a merry time at supper, Moses making clever jokes, without cracking a smile himself, and the baby romping in his high chair, eating what wasn't good for him. But the best of the evening came later, when father and baby had gone to bed, and the dishes were put away, and there was not a crumb left on the red and white checked tablecloth. Frida took out her sewing, and I took a book, and the lamp was between us, shining on the table, on the large brown roses on the wall, on the green and brown diamonds of the oilcloth on the floor on the baby's rattle on a shelf, and on the shining stove in the corner. It was such a pleasant kitchen, such a cozy, friendly room, that when Frida and I were left alone, I was perfectly happy just to sit there. Frida had a beautiful parlor, with plush chairs and a velvet carpet and gilt picture frames, but we preferred the homely, home-like kitchen. I read aloud from Longfellow, or Whittier, or Tennyson, and it was as great a treat to me as it was to Frida. Her attention alone was inspiring. Her delight, her eager questions doubled the meaning of the lines I read. Poor Frida had little enough time for reading, unless she stole it from the sewing, or the baking, or the mending. 
but she was hungry for books, and so grateful when I came to read to her, that it made me ashamed to remember all the beautiful things I had and did not share with her. It is true I shared what could be shared. I brought my friends to her. At her wedding were some of the friends of whom I was most proud. Miss Dillingham came, and Mr. Hurd, and the humbler guests stared in admiration at our school teachers and editors. But I had so many delightful things that I could not bring to Frida, my walks, my dreams, my adventures of all sorts. And yet when I told her about them, I found that she partook of everything. For she had her talent for vicarious enjoyment, by means of which she entered as an actor into my adventures, was present as a witness at the frolic of my younger life. Or if I narrated things that were beyond her, on account of her narrower experience, she listened with an eager longing to understand that was better than some people's easy comprehension. My world ever rang with good tidings, and she was grateful if I brought her the echo of them, to ring again within the four walls of the kitchen that bounded her life. And I, who lived on the heights, and walked with the learned, and bathed in the crystal fountains of youth, sometimes climbed the sublimest peak in my sister's humble kitchen, there caught the unfaltering accents of inspiration, and rejoiced in silver pools of untried happiness. The way she reached out for everything fine was shown by her interest in the incomprehensible Latin and French books that I brought. She liked to hear me read my Cicero, pleased by the movement of the sonorous periods. I translated Ovid and Virgil for her, and her pleasure illumined the difficult passages, so that I seldom needed to have recourse to the dictionary. I shall never forget the evening I read to her, from the Aeneid, the passage in the fourth book describing the death of Dido. I read the Latin first, and then my own version in English hexameters, that I had prepared for a recitation at school. Frida forgot her sewing in her lap, and leaned forward in rapt attention. When I was through, there were tears of delight in her eyes, and I was surprised myself at the beauty of the words I had just pronounced. I do not dare to confess how much of my Latin I have forgotten, lest any of the devoted teachers who taught me should learn the sad truth. But I shall always boast of some acquaintance with Virgil, through that scrap of the Aeneid made memorable by my sister's enjoyment of it. Truly my education was not entirely in the hands of the persons who had licenses to teach. My sister's fat baby taught me things about the origin and ultimate destiny of dimples, that were not in any of my school books. Mr. Casey of the second floor, who was drunk whenever his wife was sober, gave me an insight into the psychology of the beer-mug, that would have added to the mental furniture of my most scholarly teacher. The bold-faced girls who passed the evening on the corner, in promiscuous flirtation with the cock-eyed youths of the neighborhood, unconsciously revealed to me the eternal secrets of adolescence. My neighbor of the third floor, who sat on the curbstone with the scabby baby in her bedraggled lap, had things to say about the fine ladies who came in carriages to inspect the public bathhouse across the street that ought to be repeated in the lecture halls of every school of philanthropy. Instruction poured into my brain at such a rate that I could not digest it all at the time. But in later years, when my destiny had led me far from Dover Street, the emphatic moral of those lessons became clear. The memory of my experience on Dover Street became the strength of my convictions, the illumined index of my purpose the aureola of my happiness. And if I paid for those lessons with days of privation and dread, with nights of tormenting anxiety, I count the price cheap. Who would not go to a little trouble to find out what life is made of? Life in the slums spins busily as a schoolboy's top, and one who has heard its humming never forgets. I look forward to telling, when I get to be a master of language, what I read in the crooked cobblestones when I revisited Dover Street the other day. Dover Street was never really my residence, at least not the whole of it. It happened to be the nook where my bed was made. But I inhabited the city of Boston. In the pearl-misty morning, in the ruby-red evening, I was empress of all I surveyed from the roof of the tenement house. I could point in any direction, and name a friend who would welcome me there. Off towards the northwest, in the direction of Harvard Bridge, which some day I should cross on my way to Radcliffe College, was one of my favorite palaces, whither I resorted every day after school. A low, wide-spreading building, with a dignified granite front it was, flanked on all sides by noble old churches, museums, and schoolhouses, harmoniously disposed around a spacious triangle, called Copley Square. 
Two thoroughfares that came straight from the green suburbs swept by my palace, one on either side, converged at the apex of the triangle, and pointed off, past the public garden, across the historic common, to the domed state house, sitting on a height. It was my habit to go very slowly up the low, broad steps to the palace entrance, pleasing my eyes with the majestic lines of the building, and lingering to read again the carved inscriptions. Public Library built by the people, free to all. Did I not say it was my palace? Mine, because I was a citizen. Mine, though I was born an alien. Mine, though I lived on Dover Street. My palace, mine. I loved to lean against a pillar in the entrance hall, watching the people go in and out. Groups of children hushed their chatter at the entrance, and skipped, whispering and giggling in their fists, up the grand stairway, patting the great stone lines at the top, with an eye on the aged policeman down below. Spectacled scholars came slowly down the stairs, loaded with books, heedless of the lofty arches that echoed their steps. Visitors from out of town lingered long in the entrance hall, studying the inscriptions and symbols on the marble floor. And I loved to stand in the midst of all this, and remind myself that I was there, that I had a right to be there, that I was at home there. All these eager children, all these fine-browed women— all these scholars going home to write learned books. I and they had this glorious thing in common, this noble treasure-house of learning. It was wonderful to say, This is mine. It was thrilling to say, This is ours. I visited every part of the building that was open to the public. I spent rapt hours studying the abbey pictures. I repeated to myself lines from Tennyson's poem before the glowing scenes of the Holy Grail. Before the prophets in the gallery above I was mute, but echoes of the Hebrew psalms I had long forgotten throbbed somewhere in the depths of my consciousness. The Chavanese series around the main staircase I did not enjoy for years. I thought the pictures looked faded, and their symbolism somehow failed to move me at first. Bates Hall was the place where I spent my longest hours in the library. I chose a seat far at one end, so that looking up from my books I would get the full effect of the vast reading room. I felt the grand spaces under the soaring arches as a personal attribute of my being. The courtyard was my sky-roofed chamber of dreams. Slowly strolling past the endless pillars of the colonnade, the fountain murmured in my ear of all the beautiful things in all the beautiful world. I imagined that I was a Greek of the classic days, treading on sandaled feet through the glistening marble porticos of Athens. I expected to see, if I looked over my shoulder, a bearded philosopher in a drooping mantle, surrounded by beautiful youths with wreathed locks. Everything I read in school, in Latin or Greek, everything in my history books was real to me here, in this courtyard, set about with stately columns. Here is where I like to remind myself of Polotsk, the better to bring out the wonder of my life. That I who was born in the prison of the Pale should roam at will in the land of freedom was a marvel that it did me good to realize." that I who was brought up to my teens almost without a book should be set down in the midst of all the books that ever were written was a miracle as great as any on record, that an outcast should become a privileged citizen, that a beggar should dwell in a palace. This was a romance more thrilling than poet ever sung. Surely I was rocked in an enchanted cradle. From the public library to the state house is only a step, and I found my way there without a guide. The State House was one of the places I could point to, and say that I had a friend there to welcome me. I do not mean the representative of my district, though I hope he was a worthy man. My friend was no less a man than the Honorable Senator Rowe, from Worcester, whose letters to me, written under the embossed letterhead of the Senate Chamber, I could not help exhibiting to Florence Connolly. How did I come by a senator? Through being a citizen of Boston, of course. To be a citizen of the smallest village in the United States, which maintains a free school and a public library, is to stand in the path of the splendid processions of opportunity. And as Boston has rather better schools, and a rather finer library than some other villages, it comes natural there for children in the slums to summon gentlemen from the State House to be their personal friends. It is so simple, in Boston, you are a schoolgirl, and your teacher gives you a ticket for the annual historical lecture in the Old South Church on Washington's birthday. You hear a stirring discourse on some subject in your country's history, and you go home with a heart bursting with patriotism. You sit down and write a letter to the speaker who so moved you, 
telling him how glad you are to be an American, explaining to him, if you happen to be a recently made American, why you love your adopted country so much better than your native land. Perhaps the patriotic lecturer happens to be a senator, and he reads your letter under the vast dome of the state house, and it occurs to him that he and his eminent colleagues, and the stately capital, and the glorious flag that floats above it, all gathered on the hill above the common, do his country no greater honor than the outspoken admiration of an ardent young alien. The senator replies to your letter, inviting you to visit him at the state house, and in the renowned chamber where the august business of the state is conducted, you, an obscure child from the slums, and he, a chosen leader of the people, seal a democratic friendship based on the love of a common flag. Even simpler than to meet a senator was it to become acquainted with a man like Edward Everett Hale, the grand old man of Boston the people called him, from the manner of his life among them. He kept open house in every public building in the city. Wherever two citizens met to devise a measure for the public weal, he was a third. Wherever a worthy cause needed a champion, Dr. Hale lifted his mighty voice. At some time or another, his colossal figure towered above an eager multitude, from every pulpit in the city, from every lecture platform. And where is the map of Boston that gives the names of the lost alleys and backways, where the great man went in search of the lame in body, who could not join the public assembly, in quest of the maimed in spirit, who feared to show their faces in the open? If all the little children who have sat on Dr. Hale's knee were started in a procession on the state house steps, standing four abreast, there would be a lane of merry faces across the common, out to the public library, over Harvard Bridge, and away beyond to remoter landmarks. That I met Dr. Hale is no wonder. It was as inevitable as that I should be a year older every twelve month. He was a part of Boston, as the salt wave is a part of the sea. I can hardly say whether he came to me or I came to him. We met, and my adopted country took me closer to her breast. A day or two after our first meeting, I called on Dr. Hale, at his invitation. It was only eight o'clock in the morning, you may be sure, because he had risen early to attend to a hundred great affairs, and I had risen early so as to talk with a great man before I went to school. I think we liked each other a little more for the fact that when so many people were still asleep, we were already busy, in the interests of citizenship and friendship. We certainly liked each other. I am sure I did not stay more than fifteen minutes, and all that I recall of our conversation was that Dr. Hale asked me a great many questions about Russia, in a manner that made me feel that I was an authority on the subject, and with his great hand in good-bye he gave me a bit of homely advice, namely, that I should never study before breakfast. That was all, but for the rest of the day I moved against a background of grandeur. There was a noble ring to Virgil that day that even my teacher's firm translation had never brought out before. Obscure points in the history lesson were clear to me alone, of the thirty girls in the class, and it happened that the tulips in Copley Square opened that day, and shone in the sun like lighted lamps. Any one could be happy a year on Dover Street, after spending half an hour on Highland Street. I enjoyed so many half-hours in the great man's house, that I do not know how to convey the sense of my remembered happiness. My friend used to keep me in conversation a few minutes, in the famous study that was fit to have been preserved as a shrine, after which he sent me to roam about the house, and explore his library, and take away what books I pleased. Who would feel cramped in a tenement, with such royal privileges as these? Once I brought Dr. Hale a present, a copy of a story of mine that had been printed in a journal, and from his manner of accepting it, you might have thought that I was a princess dispensing gifts from a throne. I wish I had asked him, that last time I talked with him, how it was that he who was so modest made those who walked with him so great. Modest as the man was the house in which he lived, a grey old house of a style that New England no longer builds, with a pillared porch curtained by vines, set back in the yard behind the old trees. Whatever cherished flowers glowed in the garden behind the house, the common daisy was encouraged to bloom in front and was there sun or snow on the ground, the most timid hand could open the gate, the most humble visitor was sure of a welcome. Out of that modest house the troubled came comforted, the fallen came uplifted, the noble came inspired. My explorations of Dr. Hale's house might not have brought me to the gables, but for my friend's daughter, the artist, who had a studio at the top of the house. 
She asked me one day if I would sit for a portrait, and I consented with the greatest alacrity. It would be an interesting experience, and interesting experiences were the bread of life to me. I agreed to come every Saturday morning, and felt that something was going to happen to Dover Street. When I came home from my talk with Miss Hale, I studied myself long in the blotched looking glass. I saw just what I expected. My face was too thin, my nose too large, my complexion too dull. My hair, which was curly enough, was too short to be described as luxurious tresses, and the color was neither brown nor black. My hands were neither white nor velvety. The fingers ended decidedly, instead of tapering off like rosy dreams. I was disgusted with my wrists. They showed too far below the tight sleeves of my dress of the year before last, and they looked consumptive. No, it was not for my beauty that Miss Hale wanted to paint me. It was because I was a girl, a person, a piece of creation. I understood perfectly. If I could write an interesting composition about a broom, why should not an artist be able to make an interesting picture of me? I had done it with the broom. And the milk wagon and the rain spout. It was not what a thing was that made it interesting, but what I was able to draw out of it. It was exciting to speculate as to what Miss Hale was going to draw out of me. The first sitting was indeed exciting. There was hardly any sitting to it. We did nothing but move around in the studio and move the easel around and try on ever so many backgrounds and ever so many poses. In the end, of course, we left everything just as it had been at the start. Because Miss Hale had had the right idea from the beginning. But I understood that a preliminary tempest in the studio was the proper way to test that idea. I was surprised to find that I should not be obliged to hold my breath, and should be allowed to wink all I wanted. Posing was just sitting with my hands in my lap, and enjoying the most interesting conversation with the artist. We hit upon such out of the way topics. Once, I remember, we talked about the marriage laws of different states. I had a glorious time, and I believe Miss Hale did too. I watched the progress of the portrait with utter lack of comprehension, and with perfect faith in the ultimate result. The morning flew so fast that I could have sat right on into the afternoon without tiring. Once or twice I stayed to lunch, and sat opposite the artist's mother at table. It was like sitting face to face with Martha Washington, I thought. Everything was wonderful in that wonderful old house. One big thing disturbed my enjoyment of those Saturday mornings. It was a small thing, hardly as big as a pen wiper. It was a silver coin which Miss Hale gave me regularly when I was going. I knew that models were paid for sitting, but I was not a professional model. When people sat for their portraits, they usually paid the artist instead of the artist paying them. Of course, I had not ordered this portrait, but I had such a good time sitting that it did not seem to me I could be earning money. But what troubled me was not the suspicion that I did not earn the money, but that I did not know what was in my friend's mind when she gave it to me. Was it possible that Miss Hale had asked me to sit on purpose to be able to pay me so that I could help pay the rent? Everybody knew about the rent sooner or later because I was always asking my friends what a girl could do to make a landlady happy. Very possibly Miss Hale had my landlady in mind when she asked me to pose. I might have asked her. I dearly loved explanations which cleared up hidden motives, but her answer would not have made any real difference. I should have accepted the money just the same. Miss Hale was not a stranger, like Mr. Strong when he offered me a quarter. She knew me, she believed in my cause, and she wanted to contribute to it. Thus I, in my hair splitting analysis of persons and motives, while the portrait went steadily on. It was Miss Hale who first found a use for our superfluous baby. She came to Dover Street several times to study our tiny Celia, in swaddling clothes improvised by my mother, after the fashion of the old country. Miss Hale wanted a baby for a picture of the Nativity, which she was doing for her father's church. And of all the babies in Boston, our Celia, our little Jewish Celia, was posing for the Christ child. It does not matter in this connection that the infant that lies in the lantern light, brooded over by the mother's divine sorrow of love, In the beautiful altarpiece in Dr. Hale's church was not actually painted from my mother's baby in the end. The point is that my mother, in less than half a dozen years of America, had so far shaken off her ancient superstitions that she feared no evil consequence from letting her child pose for a Christian picture. A busy life I led on Dover Street, a happy, busy life. When I was not reciting lessons, nor writing midnight poetry, nor selling papers, nor posing, 
nor studying sociology, nor pickling bugs, nor interviewing statesmen, nor running away from home. I made long entries in my journal, or wrote forty-page letters to my friend. It was a happy thing that poor Mrs. Hutch did not know what sums I spent for stationery and postage stamps. She would have gone into consumption, I do believe, from inexpressible indignation. And she would have been in the right, to be indignant, not to go into consumption. I admit it, she would have been justified, from her point of view. From my point of view, I was also in the right. Of course I was. To make friends among the great was an important part of my education, and was not to be accomplished without a liberal expenditure of paper and postage stamps. If Mrs. Hutch had not repulsed my offer of confidences, I could have shown her long letters written to me by people whose mere signature was prized by autograph hunters. It is true that I could not turn those letters directly into rent money, or if I could, I would not, but indirectly my interesting letters did pay a week's rent now and then. Through the influence of my friends, my father sometimes found work that he could not have got in any other way. These practical results of my costly pursuit of friendships might have given Mrs. Hutch confidence in my ultimate solvency, had she not remained obstinately deaf to my plea for time, her heart being set on direct, immediate, convertible cash payment. That was very narrow-minded, even though I say it who should not. The grocer on Harrison Avenue, who supplied our table, could have taught her to take a more liberal view. We were all anxious to teach her, if she only would have listened. Here was this poor grocer, conducting his business on the same perilous credit system which had driven my father out of Chelsea and Wheeler Street, supplying us with tea and sugar and strong butter, milk freely splashed from rusty cans, potent yeast and bananas done to a turn, with everything, in short, that keeps a poor man's family hearty in spite of what they eat, and all of this for the consideration of part payment, with the faintest prospect of a future settlement in full. Mr. Rosenblum had an intimate knowledge of the financial situation of every family that traded with him, from the gossip of his customers around his herring-barrel. He knew without asking that my father had no regular employment, and that, consequently, it was risky to give us credit. Nevertheless, he gave us credit by the week, by the month, accepted partial payments with thanks, and let the balance stand by the year. We owed him as much as the landlady, I suppose, every time he balanced our account. But he never complained. Nay, he even insisted on my mother's taking almonds and raisins for a cake for the holidays. He knew, as well as Mrs. Hutch, that my father kept a daughter at school, who was of age to be put to work. But so far was he from reproaching him for it, that he detained my father by the half-hour, inquiring about my progress and discussing my future. He knew very well, did the poor grocer, who it was that burned so much oil in my family. But when I came in to have my kerosene can filled, he did not fall upon me with harsh words of blame. Instead, he wanted to hear about my latest triumph at school, and about the great people who wrote me letters and even came to see me and he called his wife from the kitchen behind the store to come and hear of these grand doings. Mrs. Rosenblum, who could not sign her name, came out in her faded calico wrapper, and stood with her hands folded under her apron, shy and respectful before the embryo scholar, and she nodded her head sideways in approval, drinking in with envious pleasure her husband's Yiddish version of my tale. If her black-eyed Goldie happened to be playing jackstones on the curb, Mrs. Rosenblum pulled her into the store, to hear what distinction Mr. Anton's daughter had won at school, bidding her take example from Mary, if she would also go far in education. Hear you, Goldie? She has the best marks in everything, Goldie, all the time. She is only five years in the country, and she'll be in college soon. She beats them all in school, Goldie. Her father says she beats them all. She studies all the time, all night, and she writes. It is a pleasure to hear. She writes in the paper, Goldie. You ought to hear Mr. Anton read what she writes in the paper. Long pieces. You don't understand what he reads, Ma, Goldie interrupted mischievously, and I want to laugh, but I refrain. Mr. Rosenblum does not fill my can. I am forced to stand and hear myself eulogized. Not understand? Of course I don't understand. How should I understand? I was not sent to school to learn. Of course I don't understand. But you don't understand, Goldie, and that's a shame. If you would put your mind on it and study hard, like Mary Anton, you would also stand high, and you would go to high school and be somebody. Would you send me to high school, Pa? Goldie asks, to test her mother's promises. Would you really? Sure as I am a Jew, Mr. Rosenblum promptly replies, a look of aspiration in his deep eyes. 
Only show yourself worthy, Goldie, and I'll keep you in school till you get to something. In America, everybody can get to something, if he only wants to. I would even send you farther than high school. To be a teacher, maybe. Why not? In America, everything is possible. But you have to work hard, Goldie, like Mary Anton. Study hard. Put your mind on it. Oh, I know it, Pa, Goldie exclaims, her momentary enthusiasm extinguished at the thought of long lessons indefinitely prolonged. Goldie was a restless little thing who could not sit long over her geography book. She wriggled out of her mother's grasp now and made for the door, throwing a backhand as she went, without losing a single jackstone. I hate long lessons, she said. When I graduate summer school next year, I'm going to work in Jordan Marsh's big store and get three dollars a week and have lots of fun with the girls. I can't write pieces in the paper anyhow. Becky, Becky Hervich, where are you going? Wait a minute, I'll go along. And she was off, leaving her ambitious parents to shake their heads over her flightiness. Mr. Rosenblum gave me my oil. If he had had postage stamps in stock, he would have given me all I needed, and felt proud to think that he was assisting in my important correspondences. And he was a poor man, and had a large family, and many customers who paid as irregularly as we. He ran the risk of ruin, of course, but he did not scold, not us at any rate, for he understood. He was himself an immigrant Jew of the type that values education, and sets a great price on the higher development of the child. He would have done in my father's place just what my father was doing, borrow, beg, go without, run in debt, anything to secure for a promising child the fulfillment of the promise. That is what America was for. The land of opportunity it was, but opportunities must be used, must be grasped, held, squeezed dry. To keep a child of working age in school was to invest the meager present for the sake of the opulent future. If there was but one child in a family of twelve who promised to achieve an intellectual career, the other eleven, and father and mother, and neighbors must devote themselves to that one child's welfare, and feed and clothe and cheer it on, and be rewarded in the end by hearing its name mentioned with the names of the great. So the poor grocer helped to keep me in school, for I do not know how many years. And this is one of the things that is done on Harrison Avenue, by the people who pitch rubbish through their windows. Let the city fathers strike the balance. Of course, this is wretched economics. If I had a son who wanted to go into the grocery business, I should take care that he was well grounded in the principles of sound bookkeeping and prudence. But I should not fail to tell him the story of the Harrison Avenue grocer, hoping that he would puzzle out the moral. Mr. Rosenblum himself would be astonished to hear that any one was drawing morals from his manner of conducting his little store. And yet it is from men like him that I learn the true values of things. The grocer weighed me out a quarter of a pound of butter, and when the scales were even, he threw in another scrap. Nah, he said, smiling across the counter, you can carry that much around the corner. Plainly, he was showing me that if I have not as many houses as my neighbor, that should not prevent me from cultivating as many graces. If I made some shamefaced reference to the unpaid balance, Mr. Rosenblum replied, I guess you're not thinking of running away from Boston yet. You haven't finished turning the libraries inside out, have you? In this way, he reminded me that there were things more important than conventional respectability. The world belongs to those who can use it to the best advantage, the grocer seemed to argue, and I found that I had the courage to test this philosophy. From my little room on Dover Street, I reached out for the world, and the world came to me. Through books, through the conversation of noble men and women, through communion with the stars in the depth of night, I entered into every noble chamber of the palace of life, I employed no charm to win admittance. The doors opened to me because I had a right to be within. My patent of nobility was the longing for the abundance of life with which I was endowed at birth, and from the time I could toddle unaided, I had been gathering into my hand everything that was fine in the world around me. Given health and standing room, I should have worked out my salvation even on a desert island. Being set down in the Garden of America, where opportunity waits on ambition, I was bound to make my days a triumphal march toward my goal. The most unfriendly witness of my life will not venture to deny that I have been successful, for aside from subordinate desires for greatness or wealth or specific achievement, my chief ambition in life has been to live, and I have lived. A glowing life has been mine, and the fires that blazed highest in all my days were kindled on Dover Street. 
I have never had a dull hour in my life. I have never had a livelier time than in the slums. In all my troubles I was thrilled through and through, with a prophetic sense of how they were to end. A halo of romance floated before every tomorrow. The wings of future adventures rustled in the dead of night. Nothing could be quite common that touched my life, because I had a power for attracting uncommon things. And when my noblest dreams shall have been realized, I shall meet with nothing finer, nothing more remote from the commonplace, than some of the things that came into my life on Dover Street. Friends came to me bearing noble gifts of service, inspiration, and love. There came one, to talk with whom was to double the volume of life. She left roses on my pillow when I lay ill, and in my heart she planted a longing for greatness that I have yet to satisfy. Another came whose soul was steeped in sunshine, whose eyes saw through every pretense, whose lips mocked nothing holy. And one came who carried the golden key that unlocked the last secret chamber of life for me. Friends came trooping from everywhere, and some were poor and some were rich, but all were devoted and true, and they left no niche in my heart unfilled, and no want unsatisfied. To be alive in America, I found out long ago, is to ride on the central current of the river of modern life, and to have a conscious purpose is to hold the rudder that steers the ship of fate. I was alive to my fingertips back there on Dover Street, and all my girlish purposes served one main purpose. It would have been amazing if I had stuck in the mire of the slum. By every law of my nature, I was bound to soar above it, to attain the fairer places that wait for every emancipated immigrant. A characteristic thing about the aspiring immigrant is the fact that he is not content to progress alone. Solitary success is imperfect success in his eyes. He must take his family with him as he rises. So when I refused to be adopted by a rich old man, and clung to my family in the slums, I was only following the rule and I can tell it without boasting, because it is no more to my credit than that I wake refreshed after a night's sleep. This suggests to me a summary of my virtues, through the exercise of which I may be said to have attracted my good fortune. I find that I have always given nature a chance, I have used my opportunities, and have practiced self-expression. So much my enemies will grant me. More than this my friends cannot claim for me. In the Dover Street days I did not philosophize about my private character, nor about the immigrant and his ways. I lived the life, and the moral took care of itself. And after Dover Street came Apple Pie Alley, Letterbox Lane, and other evil corners of the slums of Boston, till it must have looked to our neighbors, as if we meant to go on forever exploring the underworld. But we found a shortcut. We found a shortcut. And the route we took from the tenements of the stifling alleys to a darling cottage of our own, where the sun shines in at every window, and the green grass runs up to our very doorstep, was surveyed by the Pilgrim Fathers, who transcribed their field notes on a very fine parchment, and called it the Constitution of the United States. It was good to get out of Dover Street. It was better for the growing children, better for my weary parents, better for all of us, as the clean grass is better than the dusty pavement. But I must never forget— that I came away from Dover Street with my hands full of riches. I must not fail to testify that in America a child of the slums owns the land and all that is good in it. All the beautiful things I saw belonged to me if I wanted to use them. All the beautiful things I desired approached me. I did not need to seek my kingdom. I had only to be worthy, and it came to me, even on Dover Street. Everything that was ever to happen to me in the future had its germ or impulse in the conditions of my life on Dover Street. My friendships, my advantages and disadvantages, my gifts, my habits, my ambitions, these were the materials out of which I built my afterlife, in the open workshop of America. My days in the slums were pregnant with possibilities. It only needed the ripeness of events to make them fruit forth in realities. Steadily as I worked to win America, America advanced to lie at my feet. I was an heir on Dover Street, awaiting maturity, I was a princess, waiting to be led to the throne. End of chapter 19「Chapter 20 of the Promised Land – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Promised Land by Mary Anton. Chapter 20 – The Heritage – one of the inherent disadvantages of premature biography is that it cannot go to the natural end of the story. 
This difficulty threatened me in the beginning, but now I find I do not need to tax my judgment to fix the proper stopping place. Sudden qualms of reluctance warn me where the past and present meet. I have reached a point where my yesterdays lie in a quick heap, and I cannot bear to prod and turn them and set them up to be looked at. For that matter, I am not sure that I should add anything really new, even if I could force myself to cross the line of discretion. I have already shown what a real thing is this American freedom that we talk about, and in what manner a certain class of aliens make use of it. Anything that I might add of my later adventures would be a repetition, in substance, of what I have already described. Having traced the way an immigrant child may take from the ship through the public schools, passed on from hand to hand by the ready teachers, through free libraries and lecture halls, inspired by every occasion of civic consciousness, dragging through the slums the weight of private disadvantage, but heartened for the effort by public opportunity, welcomed at a hundred open doors of instruction, initiated with pomp and splendor and flags unfurled, seeking in American minds the American way, and finding it in the thoughts of the noble. Striving against the odds of foreign birth and poverty, and winning, through the use of abundant opportunity, a place as enviable as that of any native child, having traced the footsteps of the young immigrant almost to the college gate, the rest of the course may be left to the imagination. Let us say that from the Latin school on I lived very much as my American schoolmates lived, having overcome my foreign idiosyncrasies, and the rest of my outward adventures, you may read in any volume of American feminine statistics. But lest I be reproached for a sudden affectation of reserve, after having trained my reader to expect the fullest particulars, I am willing to add a few details. I went to college as I proposed, though not to Radcliffe. Receiving an invitation to live in New York that I did not like to refuse, I went to Barnard College instead. There I took all the honors that I deserved, and if I did not learn to write poetry, as I once supposed I should, I learned at least to think in English without an accent. Did I get rich? You may want to know, remembering my ambition to provide for the family. I can reply that I have earned enough to pay Mrs. Hutch the arrears, and satisfy all my wants. And where have I lived since I left the slums? My favorite abode is a tent in the wilderness, where I shall be happy to serve you a cup of tea out of a tin kettle, and answer further questions. And is this really to be the last word? Yes, though a long chapter of the romance of Dover Street is left untold. I could fill another book with anecdotes, telling how I took possession of Beacon Street, and learned to distinguish the lord of the manor from the butler in full dress. I might trace my steps from my bare room overlooking the lumber-yard, to the satin drawing-rooms of the back bay, where I drank afternoon tea with gentle ladies, whose hands were as delicate as their porcelain cups. My journal of those days is full of comments on the contrasts of life, that I copied from my busy thoughts in the evening, after a visit to my aristocratic friends. Coming straight from the cushioned refinement of Beacon Street, where the maid who brought my hostess her slippers spoke in softer accents than the finest people on Dover Street, I sometimes stumbled over poor Mr. Casey, lying asleep in the corridor, and the shock of the contrast was like a searchlight turned suddenly on my life, and I pondered over the revelation, and wrote touching poems, in which I figured as a heroine of two worlds. I might quote from my journals and poems, and build up the picture of that double life. I might rehearse the names of the gracious friends who admitted me to their tables, although I came direct from the reeking slums. I might enumerate the priceless gifts they showered on me, gifts bought not with gold, but with love. It would be a pleasant task to recall the high things that passed in the gilded drawing-rooms over the afternoon tea. It would add a splendor to my simple narrative, to weave in the portraits of the distinguished men and women who busied themselves with the humble fortunes of a schoolgirl. And finally, it would relieve my heart of a burden of gratitude to publish once for all the amount of my indebtedness to the devoted friends who took me by the hand when I walked in the paths of obscurity, and led me, by a pleasanter lane that I could have found myself, to the open fields where obstacles thinned and opportunities crowded to meet me. Outside America, I should hardly be believed if I told how simply, in my experience, Dover Street merged into the back bay. These are matters to which I long to testify, but I must wait till they recede into the past. I can conjure up no better symbol of the genuine, practical equality of all our citizens than the Hale House Natural History Club, which played an important part in my final emancipation from the slums. For all as I was regarded as a plaything by the serious members of the club, 
the attention and kindness they lavished on me had a deep significance. Every one of those earnest men and women unconsciously taught me my place in the Commonwealth, as the potential equal of the best of them. Few of my friends in the club, it is true, could have rightly defined their benevolence toward me. Perhaps some of them thought they befriended me for charity's sake, because I was a starved waif from the slums. Some of them imagined they enjoyed my society, because I had much to say for myself, and a gay manner of meeting life. But all these were only secondary motives. I myself, in my unclouded perception of the true relation of things that concerned me, could have told them all why they spent their friendship on me. They made way for me because I was their foster sister. They opened their homes to me, that I might learn how good Americans lived. In the least of their attentions to me, they cherished the citizen in the making. The Natural History Club had spent the day at Nahant, studying marine life in the tide pools, scrambling up and down the cliffs, with no thought for decorum, bent only on securing the starfish, limpets, sea urchins, and other trophies of the chase. There had been a merry lunch on the rocks, with talk and laughter between sandwiches, and strange jokes, intelligible only to the practicing naturalist. The tide had rushed in at its proper time, stealing away our seaweed cushions, drowning our transparent pools, spouting in the crevices, booming and hissing, and tossing high the snowy foam. From the deck of the jolly excursion steamer which was carrying us home, we had watched the rosy sun dip down below the sea. The members of the club, grouped in twos and threes, discussed the day's successes, compared specimens, exchanged field notes, or watched the western horizon in sympathetic silence. It had been a great day for me. I had seen a dozen new forms of life, had caught a hundred fragments of the song of nature by the sea, and my mind was seething with meanings that crowded in. I do not remember to which of my learned friends I addressed my questions on this occasion, but he surely was one of the most learned for he took up all my fragments of dawning knowledge in his discourse, and welded them into a solid structure of wisdom, with windows looking far down the past, and a tower overlooking the future. I was so absorbed in my private review of creation, that I hardly realized when we landed, or how we got into the electric cars, till we were a good way into the city. At the public library I parted from my friends, and stood on the broad stone steps, my jar of specimens in my hand, watching the car that carried them glide out of sight. My heart was full of a stirring wonder. I was hardly conscious of the place where I stood, or of the day, or the hour. I was in a dream, and the familiar world around me was transfigured. My hair was damp with sea spray, the roar of the tide was still in my ears. Mighty thoughts surged through my dreams, and I trembled with understanding. I sank down on the granite ledge beside the entrance to the library, and for a mere moment I covered my eyes with my hand. In that moment I had a vision of myself, the human creature, emerging from the dim places where the torch of history has never been, creeping slowly into the light of civilized existence, pushing more steadily forward to the broad plateau of modern life, and leaping, at last, strong and glad, to the intellectual summit of the latest century. What an awful stretch of years to contemplate! What a weighty past to carry in memory! How shall I number the days of my life, except by the stars of the night, except by the salt drops of the sea? But hark to the clamor of the city all about. This is my latest home, and it invites me to a glad new life. The endless ages have indeed throbbed through my blood, but a new rhythm dances in my veins. My spirit is not tied to the monumental past, any more than my feet were bound to my grandfather's house below the hill. The past was only my cradle, and now it cannot hold me, because I am grown too big, just as the little house in Polotsk, once my home, has now become a toy of memory, as I move about at will in the wide spaces of this splendid palace, whose shadow covers acres. No, it is not I that belong to the past, but the past that belongs to me. America is the youngest of the nations, and inherits all that went before in history. And I am the youngest of America's children, and into my hands is given all her priceless heritage." to the last white star espied through the telescope, to the last great thought of the philosopher. Mine is the whole majestic past, and mine is the shining future. End of chapter 20 End of the Promised Land by Mary Anton